Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our meeting of the Planning and Development Committee for February 10th. Uh, I believe we have two members away, Councillor Williams and Councillor Singh, who are away on municipal business. Councillor Dillon, my apologies. <laughs> Councillor Dillon and Councillor Williams are uh, uh, away on, munis on other municipal business. Um, other than that, all members are here today. So before we go to the approval of agenda, I know there are a few changes. I will ask the city clerk to review the changes. Through you, Mr. Chair, members of committee, members of the public watching or attending today's meeting and members of staff, these are the changes to this evening's planning committee agenda. Um, in regard to item 4.3, which is a statutory public meeting item on tonight's agenda, there is additional correspondence identified as 13.2, a petition, as well as a uh, piece of email correspondence that was received uh, today that has been distributed to members on your desks. In regard to uh, item 5.1 on tonight's agenda, we have an added delegation from Palvinder Gill, and this is in regard to the minutes of the Brampton Heritage Board, which is item 8.1 on this evening's agenda, and specifically on recommendation HB004-2020 for a property at McLaughlin Road. In regards to staff presentation 6.1, um, Yvonne Jung, Manager Urban Design, Planning and Development Services, will be presenting this item. And following her presentation, uh, Eric Turcott, who is the Chair of the Brampton Urban Design Review Panel, is present this evening and will come forward to say a few words in regard to the panel and answer any questions that committee may have. Moving on to the agenda, item 7.4, which is a staff report on an application to amend the official plan and zoning bylaw. Uh, there are a number of replacement pages that were posted online, and those pages are reflected here in this uh, proposed consolidated agenda. Uh, I've mentioned item 8.1, the Brampton Heritage Board minutes. There is the delegation item 5.1 associated with these minutes. And then moving on to correspondence, I identified 13.2, which is a petition of objection regarding the statutory public notice item 4.3 on this evening's agenda. As well, there is an additional piece of correspondence um, from Brampton residents that have been distributed to members this evening. I also wish to point out uh, when uh, committee gets to consent, um, item 7.2 on tonight's agenda and 7.3 uh, were um, mistakenly not identified on consent. And should committee wish to, they, uh, staff's recommendation was to add those two items to consent. If 7.3 is added to consent, there is an additional recommendation that staff have for committee's consideration at that time. Those are the changes, Mr. Okay. Chair. I see uh, Alan, you'd like to speak? Yes, through you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there is uh, an item that we would like to address, sorry, and I'll, I'll defer to Councillor Palacio on this matter. I'm swinging for my mic. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Helen. Um, I, I have a proposed amendment, and uh, so I'd like to deal with it in the order of the regular business of 7.3 and not add it to consent. <coughs> but I'm okay with adding 7.2 to consent. Okay, so members of committee, uh, are there any further additions, changes, or deletions to the agenda? No one's on the board? Okay, so um, we have right now 7.2. Uh, oh, but we'll do that at the consent agenda. Okay, so if there's no further changes, can I get a, a motion to approve the agenda for today's meeting? Are you on the board? Councillor Singh. I'll add uh, 7.4 on the consent as well. Sorry, 7.4. So through you, Mr. Chair, uh, Councillor Singh, we're just at approval of the agenda, and then we'll come to the consent motion in a few minutes. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Councillor Singh. Uh, all in favor of moving the agenda as is, moved by Councillor Fortini, all in favor? Carried, thank you. Uh, declarations of pecuniary interest. Do any members have declaration of pecuniary interest on the municipal conflict of interest uh, for any matter to be considered on today's agenda? Okay, nobody will so note it for meeting minutes. Uh, now we go to the consent agenda. So we right now have um, item 7.2 and I see here 7.5. Are there any further changes? So I see several people. Councillor Santos. Thank you, through you, Chair. I just have a couple of questions regarding 7.5. So you'd so, like to pull it? Yes, please. Okay, so noted. Councillor Singh. 7.4 in consent, please. 7.4 in consent. 
Okay. Uh, Councilor Fortini. Yes, uh, so on the 10.1, I think so. That can so be you'd like to move a consent 10.1? Okay. So may I have a, motion, a motion to approve the agenda for today's meeting? Moved by Councilor Singh. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. So we now go on to statutory public uh, meetings on today's agenda. Uh, so our first report is item 4.1. Are there, is anyone here to listen or would like to have a presentation regarding item 4.1, which is a city nation am amendment to the zoning bylaw to unit dwelling parking requirements. Would anyone would like to hear a staff presentation? Going once, twice, and you would like to hear a presentation? Item 4.1? Oh, you would like to see a presentation? Okay, that's, if that's the will. So I'd invite staff to come forward. So just as a reminder to everyone in the audience tonight that this is a public, we're at the public meeting portion of the Planning Development Committee. It's held in accordance with the requirements of the Planning Act of Ontario. The proposals to be heard at this public meeting are the result of applications made under the Planning Act. These are not proposals of the City of Brampton unless they are specifically identified as city-initiated proposals. One of the three statutory public meet meetings on this evening uh, is a city-initiated proposal. The intent of the public meeting is to hear submissions from the public regarding these proposals. Members of the committee may ask questions for clarification, but will not engage in debate on the proposal at this time. Committee consideration on the proposal will occur at a future meeting when planning staff bring forward the final recommendation report on each proposal. The city also posted on to its website, Brampton.ca, supporting information and documentation for the development applications for public review and reference. We will now proceed to consider the item on this evening's statutory public meeting agenda. And I'll hand it over to Michelle Gervais. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, committee members, staff, and members of the public. My name is Michelle Gervais, and I'm a policy planner with the City's Planning and Development Services Department. And tonight, I will be presenting to you a City-initiated amendment to the two-unit dwelling parking requirements. So this amendment applies citywide. And so the process to date is that staff did receive direction from council back in December of 2019 to proceed with the city initiated amendment to the zoning bylaw. Notice of the public meeting was given in the Brampton Guardian and was also posted on our city's, city's website. So tonight we are having the statutory public meeting requirement. So just a bit of background. In April of 2015, City Council approved a citywide official plan amendment, which included uh, including policies into our official plan that permit second units within single detached dwellings, semi-detached dwellings, and townhouse dwellings, subject to meeting a number of the two-unit dwelling um, provisions in our zoning bylaw. So currently, right now, our zoning bylaw requires second units to provide a third parking space in order for a second unit to be registered. In 2017, there was an amendment, again, a city-initiated amendment to the two-unit dwelling parking provisions that reduced the width of the required third parking space from 2.7 meters to 2.6 meters. So just a little bit of background. In May of 2019, the province of Ontario released Bill 108, which is More Homes, More Choices Act. And that was to address um, housing supply and affordability. And part of that, there were some amendments that were made to the Planning Act of Ontario. And that includes allowing municipalities to amend their zoning bylaw that doesn't require a dedicated spark parking space to be provided um, for the sole use of the occupant for a second unit. So as briefly discussed in my introduction, there was council direction um, provided to staff back in December of 2019 to move forward with a city initiated amendment to change the parking requirements for a second unit. So our current zoning bylaw, I'm not going to read all of this, basically I've, I've summarized this um, briefly already, that 
three parking spaces are required to be provided to register a second unit, and those have to measure 2.6 meters in width by 5.0 meters in length, and all three parking spaces have to be provided solely on the property boundary. Uh, they can be provided in tandem, and you also have to meet the maximum driveway width um, requirements as set out in the zoning bylaw. So the proposed City initiated amendment is essentially going to delete that section in the bylaw and simply replace it with that no additional parking is required for a second unit within a two unit dwelling. So this is not going to change the fact that every single detached dwelling, semi-detached dwelling and townhouse dwelling still has to require the two parking spaces and that you have to adhere to the maximum driveway width standards in the city's zoning bylaw, as long as, in addition to all the other two unit dwelling um, provisions as well. So staff completed some benchmarking with respect to what do other municipalities require for uh, parking standards for second units. And what we found was that the majority of municipalities in Ontario do require an additional parking space to be provided for a second unit. However, we did find some municipalities that have some alterations to that. City of Windsor is one example where within their downtown core, where there's some smaller residential lots um, that are served well by transit, they do not require uh, an additional parking space to be provided for a second unit. Um, the City of London does not require an additional parking space to be provided for a second unit. I do have up here that the City of Markham does not require that as well, but further discussions with City of Markham planning staff. Right now, um, they don't require an additional parking space for a second unit only within their downtown area, but they're currently undergoing their comprehensive zoning bylaw review and they are looking to include that provision citywide where they would not require any additional parking spaces to be provided for a second unit. And they basically have indicated that they're hoping it's a self-regulating system where the landlords who are occupying the two required parking spaces for the primary dwelling would not be able to rent a second unit to tenants um, who do not own a car. So the purpose of this amendment is to assist in increasing the inventory of homes that would qualify for the creation of second units and as a result, uh, the supply of affordable housing units. This is just a quote from um, Steve Clark, which came out of that previous Bill 108 that I talked to you about, providing more housing choices and affordability. So the next steps, as I said, we are at the public meeting tonight. So uh, the technical analysis will be completed after tonight and we will prepare a recommendation report and a proposed zoning by law amendment that would be forwarded to a separate council meeting. And one thing I just wanted to highlight is that the Planning Act um, includes a section in there that's saying that there are no appeal rights available from the de decision of city council with respect to a zoning bylaw uh, requirement or standard that gives effect to second unit policies and regulations. So that differs from some other um, planning applications that you know you may hear tonight. So there are no appeal rights um, with respect to this proposed amendment. So the report and presentation tonight is available on the city's website. Uh, the the uh, website address is, is up there. Um, again, I'm the contact, Michelle Gervais. You're welcome to provide um, any comments that you have on this proposed amendment to myself and my email address is there. And the city also has a guide for homeowners in Brampton if you have any other questions uh, related to second units. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, at this time, we'll invite anyone who would like to come down and uh, provide uh, their opinion, delegate on the issue, uh, please come forward. Is there anyone who would like to speak on this matter? No? At this time, I'll, I'll request if anyone from committee have any questions or comments. Oh, please come forward. So 
just, just as a reminder, this discussion is not about secondary units. It's about the parking requirement for secondary units. Uh, so if you can come forward, state your name for public record, and then when you leave, you can sign in the back uh, with our clerk's office. Definitely. Thank you very much, Chair and members of the Council. And thank you for the reminder. We understand that. But there are related to things, too. For example, City of Brampton, especially in new subdivisions around north, south, east, west, the transit system is poor. Off hours, on hours, Highway 7, these are important points when you are eliminating the parking spot for the second dwelling units. We need to focus on improving the transit so more and more people rely and use the public transit. Today, it's been used a lot, but we need to increase that transit and connectivity with especially outer subdivisions. I belong to each, each side of it, but West is no different than East, South is no different. The, over the time, the focus was only one particular area all the time from the, from the development and the projects. We would like to consciously do that this season because if there are so many uh, cars on the road, that's not a great idea either. So this is, this is my comments. It, yes, it's required, it needed, at the same time we have to be conscious on how we implement and improve the transit system so everyone can, most people can rely on the transit. That's, that's all. I hope I'm not off track. Okay. Um, so the clerk, I'll refer that to you. Councilor wants to address the delegation. I'm not sure if that is standard procedure or public term meetings. So. Councilor Pelosi, would you like clarification on anything you said tonight? Yes, please. Okay, so I'll go to Councilor Pelosi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you very much for the delegation, and I know that you'll continue to uh, uh, support and, and have the discussions with the province to ensure that we get proper uh, two-way all-day go to increase our transit system, the fastest-growing transit system in, in Canada. And I wouldn't necessarily say that our transit system is poor, I would say Georgetown's transit system is poor, the lack thereof, but I, I completely understand your frustration and support you, uh, um, the delegation. Thank you very much. Yeah, that. thank you. Only last comment is, if we could increase the transportation like the way we did it for the seniors at the city level, if for the school and college university students, if subsidize that transit system for those ones who you go to university and colleges and schools, that will make a big impact in the school zones, traffic, and all over. And on a safety, it will be a big impact, on positive impact on that. We, we request council to consider that as well at the same time. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Sir? Okay, Councillor Pelosi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just really quickly, that'll be a question that we ask our, uh, our, our transit to, to come back in the, and to see what the budget implication is um, in the upcoming budget. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any further delegations? Please come forward, state your name for public record. And then you can sign with the clerk's office. And again, just a reminder, everyone has five minutes. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Ron Kiranip Sedu, and thank you for having me here. And uh, I would certainly like to um, express my opinion on uh, removing the bylaw requirement for having a third parking space. And uh, Mr. Doug Williams, um, you are from my ward, so hopefully he, he can take into consideration what I'm, my opinion. So essentially, yes, um, my thing is that, like in times of today when we're trying to reduce the carbon dioxide emissions and greenhouse gases and all that stuff, and at the same time we are trying to um, make people use public transit, I think waiving the third parking requirement would definitely make people think that, okay, maybe like we need to find a sp uh, more uh, uses city transit more and more, like uh, the other gentleman was um, suggesting. And on top of that, I believe it will also give uh, folks who have semi-detached townhomes or a smaller lots where a third parking spot is not available, they can generate some extra income to su support their livelihood, while at the same time um, provide some more like rental, uh, rental homes to, to our community. 
which I believe is much needed in the times of today, like where basically, well, we need more uh, affordable housing, we need more affordable housing, but if the supply is low, the rent is going to be high. So I believe like if we raise the supply by creating more rental homes or rental properties as a secondary unit, um, it'll help with um, folks who are really on a tight budget and who cannot afford to live in the core of a city and who have to commute like hours and hours from, um, just to work um, and learn their livelihood because they can't afford to live in a pricey town. So I believe things like that should definitely help and I believe based on my research and experience like having a third parking requirement is a big hindrance and with all those factors so hopefully uh, respectable city councillors and Mr. Doug Williams, uh, Williams sorry, <laughs> would take that into consideration and um, hopefully pass the resolution in a positive manner. Um, that's all I would like to suggest. Thank you Thank very you much. For me out. Just a reminder, you have uh, your other representative, Councillor uh, Michael Pileschi, who is your regional councillor. Okay. So, I like Doug. <laughs> I, I, I thank you very much. Thank you. Are there, thank you very much. Sure. Just a reminder to sign in the back. Uh, please come forward, say your name. If there's anyone else, I would invite you to come down, uh, please, and get in line. Yep. More than. Again, I would just remind everyone that we're speaking about the parking requirement. It's not about secondary units. It's about the parking requirement. Please say your name for public record. So those in line might want to just sign in with uh, the clerk's office behind you. Uh, you can state your name for uh, public record. Yes, thank you. My name is Kaldeep Bopare. Uh, actually, I'm fully supporting the uh, deleting of this the, the extra parking spot for the second unit. With that, there are so many people they can afford to rent that place without the car. So if there will be still bonding, then there will be little shortage of the affordable housing. Look to me, it's going to be uh, little help. I'm not saying it's going to be help all over, but it's going to be little help to be if there are some houses available, but they can't have the space for that park, uh, that uh, second unit. It's going to be very helpful. I support this one, and uh, there are some other issues, but uh, we will come back later on on those issues. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Please bro, come forward, say uh, your name. My name is Abneet Singh, and I think it's a, it's an excellent initiative by the city uh, to reduce that parking space, considering that it will bring a lot of semi-detached townhomes or single-car mm -hmm. garage homes into the market, uh, wherein people can build second dwelling units and rent it out and it's a win-win situation for both the renters as well as people who are renting out. I have a question actually, how much of, how, uh, how much of a time frame are we looking at from now to saying yes, the city passed it, it's a, the bylaw has been amended or you no, know, the city did not pass it. So what kind of a time frame are we looking at? It's a great question. We'll hand it over to staff who would like to uh, respond. Through you, um, Mr. Chairman, to the delegate, uh, we're looking at by June of this year. Oh, that's fair. Thank okay. you. Great. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dinesh. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I just want to, I think I'm echoing everyone who's uh, speaking here and uh, that this initiative is a pretty good initiative, especially given the crunch that we have. Um, although, I mean, um, this is personal to me because I've, uh, being a young family, we saved up quite a bit of money and purchased a property, which we found out that the lay basement was actually illegal. Uh, we complied with the city, got the tenant out. And the first instant was, how do I actually make it legal? I genuinely want to adhere with all the codes and all the rules that are there, and legitimately want to pay my taxes and provide the right um, support to having the housing and support it to, for my own uh, uh, need as well. But what I found out was, Although I can actually fit three cars in there, it's not actually a three car parking, legitimate legal parking uh, purpose. My primary residence, it's a single car detached home. And when I initially got the review done, I was like, I wanted, I was interested in putting one there. Um, they told me, even though yours is a single car garage home, a detached home, uh, we don't know if it'll be a, a success because the parking requirement says it needs to be a certain width and certain length. Um, lucky for me, I think I had a tandem parking so I could actually get through when I'm in the process. I've already applied for the permits and uh, 
it's in the pro process of actually getting done now. So um, I think a lot of people who want to be law abiding, who want to actually get in and do the right thing as per the rules, I think this rule, which has been overly restrictive so far, removing that will help people who want to follow the rules come in the fold. And I strongly support this. And thank you uh, for the council for understanding the needs of the citizens and then actually coming up with this. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Again, please say your name for public record. Hi, my name's uh, Pat McGrail. I live up in the Sandalwood, Jimcoozie area, across from Cassie Campbell. Um, I live alone in a detached home. I'm very conscious about my uh, climate footprint, and I think the city should be working really hard on its 24 revisions. So I am certainly in support of this amendment. Um, I have been renting my basement for quite, well, not in the moment, but for quite some time on a shared basis because it wasn't legal and I was looking forward to legalizing it. Um, and I was really surprised <laughs> when I went to do so because I have three parking spaces and they're all legal according to bylaw and everything else. So I sent a picture of it to Michelle, I think, and she says, oh no, you're not legal because uh, the, the, most of those parking spaces are on, prop on city property. My lot line is like about five feet from my front door, so most of my front yard is, <laughs> is owned by the city. So I said, how did I get my house built? Because my driveway is mostly on, well, we count your, your garage as one space. So here I have three legal spaces, but they're not counted for this purpose. I happen to actually be in an area where it's serviced very well by transit. I have three bus lines going right by me. I've got the community center, I've got a grocery store and a shopping center and everything like a block and a half away. So my tenants just love it. In fact, I've had tenants that have had cars that have parked them somewhere else and they said, well, we don't need it because the transit here is so good. So it just seems, you know, I live alone in this house and I'd like to share it and not use this great big climate footprint and I'm stuck because of the parking restriction. So I am definitely personally, but also I think it's all very important for the city to make the space available for tenants and to use encourage transit and not cars. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Hi, my name is Sartha um, and I live in the Mount Pleasant area. So I just want to echo everyone else who's come before me. Um, I support this uh, initiated by the city because it is a win-win. People who need affordable housing and people have space in their homes to give, uh, but they're not able to meet right now because of the certain requirements of the parking space. A lot of people in the area that I live in who, have, uh, who are living in the second, secondary base, uh, dwelling in the basement, they're right, they commute or they take the transit. So they live, uh, I live two minutes from the Mount Pleasant Go station. So a lot of people don't require a car who are living in the secondary unit. So this was very constructive. Uh, it was restricting a lot of people who wanted to go by the law and sort of legalize their units, but weren't able to. Same thing happened with me, which the other gentleman uh, mentioned before that um, I moved in and I wanted to legalize my basement, but I found out about the driver requirement after. Um, so now I'm in between, I'm just waiting, and I just found out that this law is being discussed, the, the removal of the parking space. So I totally uh, support it and uh, hope it's, uh, it's a law soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. So as I see, there's no further uh, request to delegate. Uh, if you have any additional information you would like to provide, again, uh, you have our uh, policy planner, michelle.gervais at brampton.ca, or you can contact your local counselors. We'll be more than happy to pass on uh, your information. So now, members of committee, are there any questions for city staff for clarification regarding this proposal? And I would stress uh, questions of clarification. Councillor Vicente. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have uh, two questions uh, seeking clarification from staff but for the benefit of everyone who is here. Um, with regards to um, re reducing this uh, requirement for second units, um, we, of course, have bylaws in place that control and manage parking on our roads and on our streets. So for everyone to be very clear, when we eliminate the need for a second unit to have an additional parking spot, that means that the homeowner has flexible options. For example, if they have two or three or four spots, 
and they have a certain number of cars, they can decide to allocate one of those spots for a tenant or not, or vice versa. Can you assure residents of the city that this does not mean that residents would be able to park on the streets at night and at other times when parking is not permitted? It doesn't give them permission to do that, correct? Through you, Mr. Chairman, that's correct. We do have our on-street parking bylaw that does permit on-street parking at some times, and you can get a certain amount of exemptions over a year, but it would not give them as of right permissions to park on the street every day, all night long. Right. And, and in that sense, there is no change from what we have had up until today to what will happen once this new um, regime is in place because parking on streets at certain times of day or for extended periods of times is essentially not permitted in most areas around the city except where it's explicitly permitted by signs, correct? Through you, Mr. Chairman, that is correct. And we are undertaking the overall citywide parking strategy, which may look at changing some of those on-street parking um, permissions, but we have not initiated that study yet to date. All right, and, and you know, it's nice to see residents um, applauding this move because we obviously, as a council, have spent a lot of time thinking about this, and we're a progressive council, and we, and we want to find ways of making the city work better for everyone. With respect to transit, I know in our conversations we have talked about how um, this is really a no-brainer uh, when it comes to properties that are in reasonable proximity to transit corridors and uh, transit hubs, et cetera. Um, what does staff foresee in terms of limiting this permission or the ability to eliminate the requirement for this parking spot for homes that perhaps are not in proximity to transit? Um, not that, of course, our transit uh, uh, staff would say that there is any part of the city that is not served well by transit, but are you, uh, do you see situations where you would put a limit on the distance between uh, a home that is considering uh, putting in a second unit and foregoing this, this requirement and the distance to a transit line or corridor or bus? So, <clears throat> through the chair, from our perspective, um, <clears throat> for, for a few reasons, one would be ease of administration and consistency in communicating to people what permissions are, are in effect. Uh, we made it uh, citywide was what we had proposed. And uh, our expectation would be, for the most part, obviously you're gonna have uh, potentially some outliers, but for the most part, you know, if someone is able to offer a parking spot and that is what the tenant requires, then they'll use it. If, if they don't have that available, then you won't be able to use it, obviously. Uh, and that would be consistent to wherever the, the transit is. So it might be that the, uh, the owner of a unit that doesn't have as good an access to transit might only have one car available so of their own, so they might have another parking spot. But really, we'd leave it up to the, uh, the owners. Uh, you know, as we go through the parking study, uh, we'll, we'll be taking a much more uh, rigorous look at the parking and the parking requirements and opportunities to change. So at the, this point in time, we felt comfortable with this, this recommendation. Uh, another question then, um, with respect to, this all really boils down to um, resident responsibility and them taking a stock of their property, how many spots do they actually have? So when a, a second unit is approved, uh, what conversation or um, um, shall we say agreement would there be in place with respect to how many parking spots do in fact exist on that property? Are we doing, is there something that the city will be doing with those applicants to ensure that they understand they have two spots or three spots or four no more. So I think um, if people would have uh, questions about how many legal spots they have, we'd certainly be able to provide a response to, to what that is. In terms of the requirements, there wouldn't necessarily be a question around that because we are not requiring additional parking spots. So what's required is the two spots that would be yeah, currently in place for the, the existing unit. So the approval would then would not comment on how many spots you have. It that, would be up to correct. the homeowner to make that assessment themselves. Yes, that's, that's correct. Thank you. Um, and, and just one final comment, if I can indulge on the chair. You know, Councillor Santos and I and other members of council <coughs> have, have been working very hard on this file. 
we've kind of coined a phrase, uh, factor out. I would just for my Councilor Vicente. I will. Be in the form I'll be of very brief, Mr. Chair. Have to uh, be a stickler for rules. Yes. We just want to factor out the car out of all of our thinking as it comes to city planning. Uh, because we do, to one of the delegates who pointed out, we spend millions every year on improving our transit system and we want to encourage members of the community to use it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Vicente. Councilor Fortini. Thank you. Uh, through the chair. Just to staff, on the, on the lady's question there about the water, the property line, most homes in the last 20 years that were built don't have that distance uh, from the house out for the parking spot. How do we address those, their concerns? <clears throat> uh, through the chair, if the uh, unit is existing and permitted, then that will continue. So the, uh, the actual question of the number of parking spots won't arise in, in the consideration for a second unit. So if I have a home, and I mentioned this many times, we look at the distance. Your water meter is your property line. And the last <clears throat> many years that we built the homes, they don't have that space. So someone that has, does not, will not be able to qualify. If I'm using it as a homeowner, why can't the renters use it? That's, it's still on the same property. I still gotta clean the snow, I still gotta maintain the driveway. If I do my driveway, I don't stop at the water meter. I gotta continue right to the boulevard or the sidewalk. Why can't the tenant use it? So, through you to the, uh, through the chair, the, with this amendment, that, that would be possible uh, because the, the additional parking wouldn't be a requirement. Mm -hmm. So, if it's available to be used, it, it could be used. So this could be used now with this new system we have. We're not requiring an additional parking spot for right. the second unit. But we still allow them two parking spots. Am I correct? So they would have to provide the two parking two spots parking consistent spots. with the existing bylaws. Right. Thank you. Good job. Thank you, uh, Councillor uh, Fortini. As I see, there's no further questions of clarifications. I would ask uh, for someone to move uh, the delegations and also receive uh, the staff presentation moved by Councillor Santos. All in favor? Carry. Thank you. We now go on to our next item. Is there anyone here who would like to hear a presentation uh, regarding um, item 4.2, application for a proposed zoning bylaw amendment to permit a transportation terminal and to rezone the property from agricultural to industrial site specific? Is there anyone here? No? Okay. Uh, I believe staff, Ellen, you wanted to add, was this item that you would like? Okay. Okay. So, uh, do we need a motion to approve? Yep. So can I get a motion moved by Councillor Plush? Oh, this is in Councillor Singh's area. All in favor? Carry. Thank you. Okay. And I also have correspondence 13.1 to receive. Moved by Councillor Singh again. All in favor? Carried, thank you. And I will give everyone an opportunity to leave as we go on to our next item, item 4.3. And I would suspect there are folks who would like to speak on this item and would like to hear a presentation as well. So if we just allow for a couple minutes so people can leave Council Chambers. Huh? Okay, if we just give me a couple seconds here. Okay, this evening we have a staff presentation from Manpreet Sia and the Development Planning and Development Services. Welcome, Manpreet. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chair, committee members, members of the public. My name is Manpreet Sian, and I'm the planner assigned to uh, process and review this application. The purpose of this public meeting is to provide information and to, uh, and, uh, information to the public and seek feedback on the application. The 
property is located on the southeast side of Clarence Street, west of Stern Avenue. The property currently has a single story commercial building with surface parking with frontage onto Clarence Street and the lands are zoned for commercial use of the property. The applicant is proposing to amend the official plan and the zoning bylaw to permit residential uses in addition to commercial uses. The amendments to the official plan and zoning bylaw will facilitate the development of the proposal. The proposed building includes the following features. An eight-story mixed-use building, 82 residential units, retail at grade level, uh, total gross floor area of 10,016 10, square meters, 112 parking spaces, and amenity, amenity area at the rear and ground floor of the site. Some preliminary views of the, of the building. So we have the views from the west, views from the east, and views from the north. The property is currently designated residential on Schedule A of the official plan. The official plan amendment is required to permit proposed mixed-use development. The applicant is proposing to amend the official plan and zoning bylaw to permit residential uses in addition to commercial uses. The amendments to the official plan and zoning bylaw will facilitate the development of the proposal. The existing zoning is service commercial. The lands have the following characteristics. A total site area of approximately 0.3 hectares, currently has access to Clarence Street and has a single story commercial building located on site. Some technical considerations that we have is the uh, sustainability score that was submitted. Uh, the location and building height relevant to adjacent low rise buildings and some traffic conditions. Staff will continue to review the, uh, review the application, including reviewing comments from the public and advance a final recommendation report to council for a decision. We will contact and follow up with those residents who have spoken, written in, or advised of interest in the, in the proposal. The report associated with tonight's meeting is available online. The presentation will be available online shortly. If you have any questions or you wish to provide any feedback to this file, please feel free to contact the city planner or the applicant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now with the, uh, believe if there's a representative of the applicant, would they like to make, would you like to speak? No, okay. So at this time, I would invite for those who would like to uh, delegate or ask questions, clarification, please come forward. State your name for public record. For anyone who else would like to delegate tonight, uh, you can please sign in with our clerk's office uh, in the back. And uh, we'll go from there. Uh, so just a reminder, everyone has five minutes. And uh, after tonight, uh, more than welcome to provide any further additional comments. Uh, please come forward. Yes. So you would like to add 10 Render minutes? Render her five minutes to me, so that makes it that's 10 fine. possible. My math is okay, Just in but case. I understand. <laughs> Just in case. So, okay, do we need a motion? Okay, so we'll take a motion to allow that because it's not normal procedure. Move by Council Fortini, all in favor, carried. Uh, so we have you for 10 minutes on the clock. Thank you. Um, I come here representing uh, 281 signatures of the immediate area of the proposed project, uh, opposing, uh, as it stands, the project. Uh, as for a letter, uh, we have submitted to the council through the clerk last week that has 208 signatures of 182 residences. And of course, all 208 signatures are voters uh, we have an additional 73 more signatures uh, at hand, not yet submitted to the city, which we will be submitting, all uh, opposing said project as it stands right now. Uh, the body of the letter 
that was signed by the neighbors states that uh, we are also requesting that city council stays as per the current bylaw for said lot, which is service commercial only, and three stories high. Uh, there are numerous concerns from the neighborhood, one of which is, uh, is the traffic concerns that we have for the neighborhood. Uh, the infrastructure maintenance of the neighborhood, which lacks and, uh, and needs a lot of, and, uh, and other uh, concerns regarding high density projects uh, into this area that currently is residential, low density. Uh, we also would like to state that uh, the city does have high density corridors that would allow for projects like these as per the bylaws of the city. So it is a great project. Uh, the neighbors think it's just the wrong place. Um, so uh, there were concerns uh, heavily noted by all the signees of the letter. Uh, I was one of the neighbors that basically went door to door. Uh, major concerns on different streets uh, Clarence, the Clarence corridor is a major concern from traffic. Uh, there's neighbors that can't even get out of their driveway currently to go to work in the morning. Uh, many of them stating we spent more than 15 minutes just to try to get out of our driveway. Uh, also, side streets within the immediate area. Uh, high speeding, very much a concern. This is a residential area that has uh, many kids little kids, a lot of pets, and in the summer, uh, a lot of them like to play in the front yard, and there's cars actually speeding at more than double the required speed limit. So uh, we will also be requesting uh, City Council that measures be taken to control the speed of the traffic going through the side streets of my, our neighborhood, coming off of Clarence, uh, problem being is uh, a lot of them use shortcuts through the neighborhood to avoid the high traffic that is already a concern on Clarence Street at different points of the uh, of set. So, as I said, we have 281 uh, neighbors of uh, the immediate area surrounding that are totally opposed to this. Uh, there's more coming because as we have requested the opinion of the neighbors, uh, at least 90%, if not more, are totally opposed to the project as it stands because of it being high density. Added to the fact that there's another high density project that apparently is in the interim of being approved or not, three blocks down the road from this current project that has 96 units within that project. So. Uh, if, if we add those two projects, we believe that you will be um, doubling the population of the immediate area with the definite consequences that that's going to bring for traffic, for safety, for infrastructure, schooling, health. We all know we have a crisis in the city so far, and, uh, and those are all concerns. Those are all concerns. So uh, I leave the floor to any any other neighbor that might want to present their case. As I said, I'm, I'm speaking for 208 of them. Thank you. And just, I guess, for the city clerk, then that was already sent, uh, the petition? OK? Yes, you <coughs> received 208 signatures. OK. Correct. There's more Thank coming. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, please come forward. Say your name for public record. Hello, my name is Susan LaBerge. I live on Mill Street um, in uh, Ward 3 and 4. And um, I just wanted to say I, uh, I knew that there would be a lot of um, residents opposing this, uh, this project, but um, I am one person that may, may have opposed it too if I hadn't been attending the 2040 Vision um, series and hearing more about the, uh, the new plans. And, um, and about also the, uh, the expected growth rate in Brampton. So um, I wanted to come in and, uh, and just um, say that 
I understand all of the issues that these residents are seeing and um, on my street, which is not in the, um, right around that area, it's a few blocks over, but um, uh, we have the same issues. You know, everybody in, in Brampton has traffic issue concerns. Um, but um, uh, I, um, I realize that we need some high density and uh, this really does seem like a good location. And it would, it would match the, the vision uh, 2040 as far as I can see it. Um, but, but people, I think, you know, it hasn't been um, expressed to the residents of Brampton anywhere um, what, you know, what the uh, council is aiming for. And when, when we get a notice um, saying, oh, there's a condo going up, an eight-story condo going up next door, everybody, you know, just panics because, you know, they look out on the street and it, it's not working. <laughs> so um, I just want to say that I really think it could work. And, um, you know, I... Uh, I, I think the, the city just has to um, help explain to the residents of what's happening and, and how it's going to work. Um, like for instance, the, uh, the one question I have, um, would, would this project go before the Brampton Urban Design Review Panel and, and would it meet their requirements? So I'll hand it to staff. I, I suspect uh, yes, but I will allow uh, Mr. Parsons. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, really, the applications that come into the city for review for development purposes, they're able to be really chosen, selected. Uh, if we see that it's uh, it's warranted that they go to the urban design review panel uh, by way of their, the, the prominence of the location, the prominence of the development itself, uh, the commissioner could choose to, yes, have that item go through to the panel. Th this is a, a case where really the, the, lo the location and the sheer um, the uh, size of the, of the development as proposed really is appropriate to go to the urban design review panel. That will allow us to really have some uh, additional expertise put through to the application to identify you know, how it is that the application could be perhaps made more sensitive or just you know, perfected in some ways. Thank you. So I understood that all of the major projects, and I think this in, would be considered a major change in project, I understood that they would all go um, before the urban design review panel, but you're saying that's not the case? So maybe that's something that the council could consider because um, you know, the, the, uh, the things that I'm concerned about are, are keeping, keeping it um, sustainable, um, making sure that the, maybe you know, the unit has solar um, power and, and passive solar and green roofs, geothermal, there's, there's lots of, lots of um, important issues for, uh, you know, for these, um, for these new high density units that are coming in. And, and even 112 parking spaces, um, maybe that could be cut down um, to encourage transit use. Um, you know, if you're in the city of Toronto, you don't get two parking spaces if, if you buy a, a condo. And um, Brampton is going to be like the city of Toronto in, you know, when it comes to the, these kinds of developments. And, and there is good transit right around this area. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it, it's not walkable yet. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, that uh, the planning department will make it walkable. Um, Clarence is a death trap to walk along, but, um, but I'm sure that it all comes, you know, as, as part of the plan. Yeah, and sir, so I just ask members of the audience, please respect uh, those folks speaking or delegating. I'm um, not popular, I know. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's fine. Uh, in terms of, uh, if you can just comment on our sustainability matrix in terms of when we review applications from the environmental impact. Yeah, definitely, Mr. Chairman. So, yes, to, to explain really to the residents that are here tonight and really, uh, interested in other development applications as well. For, for each development application that we review here at the City of Brampton, really as a requirement, uh, we have the applicants provide a sustainability really scoring summary for the project. That allows staff to, really the same way that we review all the other technical documents, which would include traffic and environmental and uh, urban design and such, we would look at the sustainability score that the applicant provides and we would really verify the score as well. You know, to see how sustainable uh, an application is by way of how walkable it would be for uh, the residents living in it, whether there are low impact 
uh, development uh, being uh, special types of ways in which uh, the engineering of the site could be done to make it more environmentally sustainable as well, how many trees are on the site. So all, all of these things really come together to identify whether a, an application is uh, sustainable or not or you know, relative degrees thereof. Uh, so that we can understand really how, how appropriate it is. And so within a future recommendation report, we'll be identifying the, the, what the score uh, is and some of the details thereof and be responding to all of the technical documents uh, at that point for the area residents to understand. Well, so right now the, the, uh, the score wasn't um, very good. It was uh, it was a little low, I think, for for a new project like this. And uh, I just would ask the uh, the committee to uh, to maybe push for a review of, um, by the UDRP and um, and also um, make sure that the old building codes aren't you know just pushing everything through. Um, and and there's some new sustainability built in. And I think if that was explained to the residents. Um, and their their uh, their whole area was improved. Um, I I think you would get them all on board. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, please, and state your name for public record. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sandy Dennis. I'm actually on two. Um, I'm actually one of the business owners in the plaza. I'm also a resident of the area. Um, totally agree with the traffic. It's horrible in the morning, it's horrible after five. Um, and I go with probably many business owners in the area that will be affected, because I just started up the business six and a half years ago. Just knowing that it's gonna be torn down to potentially, God knows where we're gonna go, losing potentially the clientele we've built up in the six and a half years, and not knowing basically what our future is, as well as, being in the neighborhood, so if I'm not in the business in the area, but I'm also living in the area, like it's it's horrible for traffic right now. Like, and I think everybody can agree with this, like morning traffic, afternoon, even evening, like we just don't have the roads to accommodate 82 units. We're talking about 164 probably potential people that might be living in the area. I don't think we have the cars to accommodate, not only that, if they give us a reason to come back to the unit itself, do they even have that to accommodate the clientele that are gonna be approaching our units? That goes for my hair salon, if the bakery comes back, if the restaurant comes back, if potentially the, the church comes back. That means there's a lot of people gonna be coming in and out of that plaza as well, including the, the people living there. Personally, I think it's um, the wrong mistake. That's, that's my opinion. Okay and a lot of loss of money in my case, too. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Hi. Hello. I'm Janita Brooks, and I'm a resident on Center Street, and I have a few questions. What bothers me is the preliminary views. I don't know what the building's gonna look like when it's actually finished, because there's a few buildings here in Brampton um, Main Street, Beauvaird, West Side, the blue building looks like it's coming out of outer space. What is this one gonna look like? The other question, air conditioning. The building does not have air conditioning. The units have to be installed on the outside. What is that gonna look like? The floor, the, um, uh, I'm so pissed off, sorry. <laughs> <coughs> When they did the study for the uh, traffic, it was done for 49 condominium units. That's what it says right here. Now the plan is for 82. How did, how could this be approved? It's for 49 units and yet it's for 82? How did that happen? Well, nothing, nothing's been approved today. So, so I know, but <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it looks like it's gonna be approved. And what about the gas station? Isn't there supposed to be a gas station there too? Where's that gonna be, be, be built? On the other side? Who's gonna buy these places with the gas station and with the, got, with the air conditioning outside? Please. Terrible, terrible. Sorry. Okay. Hi, my name is Navid uh, Firuzesh. I actually live on uh, Mars and Crescent, who's gonna back into uh, this unit that's being proposed. I just wanted to uh, bring up three points. I think the data, the information that is collected to uh, conduct these studies are important in decision making. 
but I encourage, as you heard from everybody, to take a look at the, the traffic information. I think selection around the timelines where you collect that data and the traffic patterns are important in that decision making because what um, and the studies that are done, the timing that's, uh, that gets done, obviously that uh, perhaps is in the, um, the benefit of the builder, not in the benefit of the residents. So I encourage the uh, due diligence on the data collection perspective. Also the privacy. I think people are not looking at this in terms of, uh, so we live there, right? So the decision around building these, uh, buying these homes and moving into a neighborhood where uh, you could build your life is, is much about uh, you know, the, you know, the, the investments you made. Uh, we will not have no privacy. People will just be looking at your, your, everything that you do, every move that you do. Uh, and that needs to be taken into consideration, especially for the people who back into these buildings that, at, that, that are directly uh, impacted by that. Uh, and lastly is the quality of life, right? So I think as you heard, as is right now, it is, you know, Brampton being bedroom communities, we, we get onto trains, we get onto buses, we go to Toronto and work in different places. Uh, it already takes long to get to where we need to go to eventually to get to where we need to go for, for our work. Uh, what would the quality of life look like with all of these residentials being added to, uh, to, to the area and the traffic and the, the, the safety concerns that are being generated? So I would like for the City Council to take a look at these things and take that into consideration. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi. Hi, my name is uh, Antonio Di Gregorio. Um, I actually live on Marsden Crescent as well. Um, I'm one of the uh, individuals that actually faces directly behind the unit. And my biggest concern um, is privacy, primarily, um, because if I have my backyard there, and of course, one of the reasons why, I, a little thing to note, uh, we just bought the house in December. And one of the reasons we like the place is because we don't have neighbors behind us. Well, now we're gonna have 82 neighbors behind us, so uh, we weren't really expecting that. So my question is, because we're directly facing behind them, are we gonna have some sort of privacy? Are we gonna have issues with noise now because I'm gonna have neighbors back there? And it looks like from the pre preliminary views is that there's gonna be a little green space with parks directly behind us, like so on the other side of my fence. So for my, my issue is, and I mean, it's not just me that's affected, it's pretty much everyone on that street. Are we gonna have issues with noise and people looking into my backyard, I wouldn't be able to use it, you know, comfortably. Anyway. Thank you. Does staff maybe want to comment? Is that, uh, um, I know we review, we demand uh, uh, parking uh, studies, but in terms of, I guess, uh, um, is there any consideration or criteria around uh, site, privacy, etc.? So through you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, all the comments being received tonight in the normal fashion will be considered by staff and will be commenting in a detailed way within the, the recommendation report. But uh, further to that, like they're, they're, it's a matter that will be providing some detail there, but if it was that the application was to be approved, uh, there is further review that occurs with planning staff and the applicant by way of the, the site plan application as well. So all, all things is, are considered with respect to Know, views, privacy, trying to minimize those uh, to the greatest extent. So we'll, we'll be commenting on that in a full summary. Great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. My name is Dave Tennant. Uh, I'm uh, from 12 Stern Avenue. I've grown up uh, on Stern Avenue pretty much my whole life. Lived, my mom and dad own 9 Stern Avenue, and I've seen every change go on around that street from ditches now to we have cement roads that eight center just goes thumpity thump down. But how many changes can come to a certain place? And I've seen so many in the last couple years. For example, the new mall that went in closer to Kennedy Road and Clarence. If you want to talk about a ticking time bomb, okay, that entrance in there, I, I feel safer in my derby car at the Brampton Demolition Derby because that place has gotten ridiculous. Then come up to the next intersection, which is where my street is. I don't even bother to go up to the satellites coming home from work. I understand transportation. I've heard it this, uh, I, at first I have actually heard of this 2040 thing. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not really on board with all that sort of stuff, but you know, everybody should be, I guess. <coughs> However, um, in my work, I 
have to go in on call doing snow business to clear the roads for people and such. I got to go in at two, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. There ain't no bus. So I'm never getting on board with that sort of thing. I can't see it for quite a while. But the amount of traffic, and I don't think it would be sustainable with a bus going down that street either. The two lanes, and I'm thinking you can't even widen that street because then the people that own the, the houses on Clarence, they're going to be stepping on the bus out the front door. <laughs> it's, I think it's way too much growth, and not to mention also the, the new development going on closer to uh, Main Street. I haven't even seen what's going to happen with that, but as most of us residents are out here, yeah, we, we've got a lot of issues, and a couple of them came up, and this is always the case. You always see something come up or somebody says something just before you come up. What about their backyard? They're going to, you know, how many people are gawking around at you that were never there before? We, we had lower buildings. Like, it, it, there was more privacy. That was one of the greatest things about whenever I bought that house. Okay, where I live. I grew up in that neighborhood. I wanted a neighborhood. I had a backyard. I had enough driveway space that you could actually have some kids who grew up and had cars and continued on with life as opposed to just like the previous one trying to find a parking spot. But now we're, we're just starting to build this into some sort of little mini city on one simple street. I, and I think, it's, uh, I think it's just a little bit beyond. It's great for growth, but it, it may not be good in the long run. I really don't think so. So that's what I'd like to say. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so just as a, a, for information regarding that plaza specifically, Councilman Mo and myself, uh, we've uh, had complaints and staff are looking at that entrance uh, as we speak. So uh, hopefully we'll have some form of uh, update in the next couple of months, uh, but staff is uh, reviewing that. Um, so uh, please state uh, your name. Thank you. My name is Stu Campbell. Um, I've been a resident on Hasselmere for over 30 years. And Hasselmere is a street that runs directly north off of Clarence in front of the proposed new building. These numbers are out of whack. Just for a bit of background, I'm a police officer of Peel Regional for 30 years, retired eight years ago. That street is a death trap. You can get nowhere. They did a feasibility study or some uh, adjustment to Clarence going over the bridge about five years ago uh, as an attempt to slow traffic down. Well, you can't slow it any far, anymore now because the cars are bumper to bumper. You can't get out. Nobody can move. You're now proposing 82 new units. 112 parking spaces proposed below grade. Then you're incorporating a corp, uh, uh, commercial space at the lower, lower half, so that's going to leave 30 parking spaces for people going in for commercial purposes. 82 residences and that you're depending upon, or the developers depending upon one car per residence. That's not going to happen. So where's the rest of the cars going? They're going on Marsden, or they're going on Hasselmere to park. They're using that Marsden, Stern, whatever, as their route around Clarence, because Clarence is a disaster. And you know this. Both of you guys know this, because you proposed, <laughs> you proposed on Bartley Bowl that they put up 40 uh, kilometer speed signs because of the exact same issue, Bartley Bowl being used as a go-around, a get-around, a get-off of Clarence. That's what all these streets are, and that's what this proposal is going to do. And when my, the value of my house goes down, I'm not going to be happy. The guy who just bought on Marsden, I'd be completely pissed right off. The owner informs that there's an intention for the building to ultimately have condominium ownership. What does that mean? Is it going to be condo or is it going to be a rental? What's the, what's the answer to that? They're saying it's going to be a condominium. It's not going to be a condominium. They did the exact same thing over on West Street. Two condominiums proposed. There are now two residential proposals. Once again, it's my backyard. And it might not sound good, but my property value goes down because you're putting up some 
rental uh, building. Forget it. And the first time that one of the small kids on Hasselmere get picked off by a driver coming from that building, racing up Hasselmere, going around uh, Marsden, racing down Stern to beat the traffic. We'll see you in court. Thank you. Okay, see you. Thank you. Come forward. State your name. Hi, good evening, Council. I'm John Marskell. I'm a resident close to the area, but not in the immediate area. And, and I pass all due respect to those who live in the area, and I am opposed to our friend on Mill Street. Um, I drive through the area a fair bit, living over by the old Branton Fairgrounds by Memorial Arena. And one thing that has stunned me as I go by there all the time is how would a, a service vehicle, like an ambulance or a fire truck or something, get through this area as it is right now? You know, then to add all of this extra, I, I don't know, to me it perplexes me a little bit where they're going to go. I, I can't see you building a gardener type expressway over top of everything. Um, so there is limited space to where things could go. And we're trying to do big street stuff on a small street. I, I don't know. I, and again, I, I'm, I'm here in support of those residents. I don't, it's not my area. Um, but however, it is concerning because I, like everybody else in this room, has to get around through Brampton somehow. And by adding this, I'm not sure that we're doing the right thing. Okay. Thank you. Please. Good evening, my name is Una Tennant and I live at number 12 Stern Avenue. And I'm concerned with the several robberies that have happened at the Hasty Market. This past summer, I found the cash register on my neighbor's lawn. So I'm concerned about this building in that, what kind of housing and can we make sure that it's not gonna be low income housing? The other issue that I have to address is speed, like everybody else has addressed on Stern Avenue and surrounding areas. This past September, my car was written off because somebody smoked it while being parked on the road. So I would like to know, um, you know, I, I'm definitely opposed to having this building put in my neighborhood. Okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Andrew Andrews. I live at 19 Meadowland Drive. Um, I'm opposed to this project, mainly because in the area itself, when I try to make a left off my own street, it takes me 10 minutes. The traffic on Clarence is insane. What is the city council's plan to develop that area? Regardless of the project, I don't care if it's a new mall, a new building, anything. Clarence is a one lane street. Every street within five blocks of the proposed project is a one lane street. Without any type of real concrete plan for the future, whether they buy out one side of the street, turn it into a green space and widen the road. As of right now, oppose it. There's nothing you can do about it. It's too much density. 82 units, let's be realistic. Most families have one to two vehicles. That requires at least 200 parking spaces. 100, it's not enough. But we want to reduce it because of our greenhouse gases, our footprint, right? Without some kind of concrete plan that we're going to develop this over 10 years or five years, whatever the plan happens to be, we're where we are now, consistent meetings, right? I oppose it. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Christine Kentner. I live on Marsden. Do you want to maybe get well. closer to the mic? Is that, that it? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Christine Kentner on Marsden Crescent. You probably also have an email that my husband and I wrote, which is in the record. I'm kind of going to reiterate it, but just listening to everyone else, I want to thank the people that have spoken and addressed so many different issues. And the person who doesn't even live in the neighborhood, we really appreciate that too. Um, I'm one of the people that have pounded the pavement over the last week and a half. I've spoken to many people, and um, people I've known for a long time, and people that are that I have, I've met for the first time, and everyone is kind of feeling the same way. Um, we've lived in our home for 41 years, 
And there are a lot of people in the neighborhood that are still original owners from the 50s. Some are second and third generation owners. Um, and I met a lot of people that are new families, anywhere from three to 12 years. And everyone says the same thing. We moved here because we loved the neighborhood, what it had to offer, how quiet it is, how everyone is has sort of come together. And um, I think that's important. Yes, maybe it's an emotional statement, but it is our neighborhood. It is a community. It's not just houses. It's not just a building. It's our homes. We raised our children. And um, I, we understand that growth is needed, but we also feel that this particular neighborhood is at pretty much max density. If you think about 82 units, that's 82 more homes, which could equate to 82 houses. 82 more houses is just not really sustainable in an already filled neighborhood. Um, a lot of people were very <laughs> vocal about the fact that this bakery might not be able to come back. They may not survive the construction period. And a lot of people in the neighborhood use the bakery on a daily basis. A lot of people come to the bakery from other neighborhoods. The same with the hair salon. Um, I spoke with that, that woman myself earlier on. Um, those are their businesses. And they, you know what? They're an established part of an already established neighborhood. It's nice to see a neighborhood that has their own little shops and things. Those are ours, and we use them, and we don't want to lose them. Um, there are three people, three homes that back directly onto this proposed uh, building, and there are two that are adjacent. We are one of the adjacent ones, and there are representatives from all five homes here this evening. We all feel the same way. Um, that view of a step design and calling it a step design because that will lower the impact of the size, it doesn't really cut it. It's still eight stories high, and it really doesn't make sense. So, um, and, and just want to reiterate that the traffic report is really out of date as it stands, and you've heard the horrendous traffic issues. Uh, I also read somewhere in near the end of the report, I think it was correspondence, and I'm I'm not quite sure, I couldn't find it again, something to do from the city to the uh, builder or planner, that they're looking down the road at access from Stern. I don't understand that or how it can, could be. I don't know if there's any answers to that at this point in time, but um, that's, that's a biggie as well. So yes, there's a lot of us that are definitely opposed changing the bylaw. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, hi, my name is Haley John. Um, I live in the neighborhood around where this is being, like the proposal is. Um, I was just wondering uh, how much actual consideration was taken into like how much this is going to disrupt the community that's already existing. Like like some people have said, like there are shop owners that are there that are trying to make a living and like you're coming and like basically just like uprooting their shops for like homes. And I just like also the traffic um, issue that's already a big issue. Like either way that you're going on clearance, it's fully stopped, it's fully backed up. You can't turn onto anything coming off of the streets that are off of clearance, like it's already a big issue to turn on to that road. So how is there gonna be this huge infrastructure being built to house people and then a little while down the road, like there's another one being built when the street is already fully congested. Like I just don't think that there was enough consideration in the issue. Okay. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Hi, my name's Bill Ward. I live at Hasselmere also, and I share the um, concerns of a lot of the people, most of the people except one. Uh, I have two other points, and mine has to do more because of the size of the building on the property. During the construction phase, 
where are cement trucks and the cranes and all that stuff going to sit? They're going to encroach on the Hazelmere or they're going to double park. And Clarence, you've heard all the people say what it's like already, okay? And to add one other thing, where are the workmen going to park? On Hazelmere, Marsden, Stern, wherever, okay? They, with that size of a building, there's no provision for construction equipment or construction workers. And they're not, the construction workers, they're not going to come by transit. No way. Okay? So I'll just leave those two I want to add. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Joanne Ryan. Um, I live um, just off of Clarence. Uh, I've been there since 97. Um, and again, that's just like a lot of the other residents. That's why we move there. It's a quiet area. It's private. Um, I currently have one child now going to school um, over at Cardinal Leger. To bring my child, I won't let her walk because Clarence is a death trap. Um, you, there's no crosswalk from Stern right down to Highway 10. You can't put a crosswalk um, because I know there's a little hill and it's just kind of safety issues. Um, so currently, I used to take about 10 minutes to get to take the left onto Clarence. Now I don't even bother. Um, I can't get her to school unless I leave 20, 25 minutes because by the time I get out on Clarence and try to get down the one lane street down to Highway 10, um, you, you just can't get down there. You can't turn up the other street because it's a, it's a one-way street coming from Cardinal Leger. Um, so right now I currently have to go down through the neighborhood along with a lot of other parents, down through the neighborhood, down through the plaza where Metro is and currently go up Highway 10. That's fine when I get there. I make my way to the school, I go to get to the school, then I come down the little one-way street to take a left onto Clarence to go home. My two-minute school ride in the morning to bring my child to school turns into 20 to 25 minutes on a good day. You can't, everything's stopped. You, if some, God forbid if somebody were to take a left onto Hasselmore, you, you can't. You, you, as soon as you stop to take a left, everything is backed up right to Highway 10, and the traffic is coming westbound towards Highway 10, so it's not like you can just take your left, you have to wait for all that to clear, so now everything's backed up behind you, everything is coming towards you, and it's the same thing coming the other way if you're going west. You go to take a left into that plaza, or whatever it is you're, you're proposing, you're gonna shut down the whole place. You want, for one person to take a left into that plaza, right now it's, I mean, it's bad enough now as it is, trying to get into the bakery, um, you're backing up to get 82 people into their residential areas and the businesses and the customers that are going to that business, it's just, it's, it's gonna be impossible to even move down that street. You can't get down there now. And like I said, I'm on side street. My street is crazy. I've never had traffic like this ever before. Everybody's using it as to get away from Clarence. So half of the residents and half the people don't even use Clarence and it's already stopped. Um, and again, you know, the gentleman that use it, uses it to come through, a lot of people use it to come through because the only access you got is Steel's or Queen, which is already jammed. So the only one really that goes across is Clarence, and it's the one way, well, one lane street, and it's already jammed solid. So I, I just don't think, and then again, we're not even considering the 92 units that's, that's gonna go up, that's proposed down the street like, I can't, you can't even get to the intersection to get your kid to school or to, to get out to Highway 10. I don't know where the cars are going to go. Grow propellers, I guess, and go up. Um, there's nowhere else to go on the road, so I really think you need to take that into consideration. The traffic is just dead right now. And like you said, I think you guys know you travel it. Um, so you just, that's one of the really big concerns. And again, is the privacy, um, the area. Um, the businesses that are currently there and, you know, the proposed businesses that are going there. You're not just talking about the residents that are, that are going to be there. You're not talking about the workers that are going to be there. You're going to be talking about the people that are going there, customers. There's just, it's like another whole city coming to the middle of one, inter one little area. Thank you. Thank you.
Yes, thank you. My name is Shirley Cook, and I reside on Marston Crescent on a lot which backs directly onto where the proposed building will be, uh, if it happens. And I'm a long time resident there. We moved in there when I was 11 months old. My parents bought the house as a brand new home. So I've lived there for 64, almost 64 and a half years. Raised my children there. They grew up with the children of others who have spoken already. I just wanted to add my voice to it. I've seen a lot of change over those years, obviously. However, this one just seems to be over the top. And I'm not opposed to change. Um, that's what growth is about. However, we talk about um, corridors for this type of growth, and our community obviously is not one of them. It cannot accommodate. I, I won't reiterate on what's been spoken already about traffic, but I now have grandchildren, and they love to come to visit Grandma. I love to have them. We play out in the backyard. I don't really want to have 82 residences looking down on our activities with my grandchildren. We have trees that are probably 50 plus years old, which block out some of, of the of existing apartment building uh, during the summer months. However, eight floors, even 50-year-old trees do not block that out for privacy. But I just, I won't repeat what's already been spoken of the concerns, and there are many, as you have heard, but I just wanted to add my voice to, to the opposing of this proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, as I see, there's no further speakers. Again, if you have any additional information you would like to provide, uh, you can uh, send it to Councillor Bowman, myself, or city staff. Um, again, I would just probably, uh, I have Councillor Bowman now, members of the committee, uh, who would like to ask questions of clarification. And I see Councillor Bowman is on the board. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, to staff, I'm just wondering, the traffic study that was done is dated 2018, is that correct? Through you, Mr. Chair, that is correct. That was the date of the report that was submitted with the application. Okay, so um, moving forward, um, do we have a traffic study that takes into account both potential new developments on Clarence? Yeah, so through you, Mr. Chair, the traffic impact statement um, actually was prepared and dated March 2019, not 2018, my apologies. Okay. And yes, it would consider what's the current state current in that state. area, as well as the impact that this proposed development would have on the current state. And the additional development down at uh, Maine and Clarence, is that included in the impact as well? I don't believe that it is, but we can clarify for you. Okay, thank you. Um, for all the residents, thank you very much for coming out and, uh, and being so passionate. Um, I would just like to ask any of the residents who signed the petition, even if they're not in that 200 meter area of notification, will we be notifying all those residents as we move forward with the process? So through Mr. Chairman, Staff will be notifying all the residents that have identified uh, themselves through uh, signing in tonight or that have given us communication on the matter, but staff will not be putting uh, public meeting follow-up letters through to all the individuals that have signed the petition. So those people who have not who have signed the petition will not be getting notified, is that what you're saying? That is correct, through Mr. Chairman. So staff always uh, identify those to those individuals that have taken the time to provide a, a comment to us on the matter. We always. Uh, put the full information back through to them to advise when the recommendation report will be coming forward so they're aware and can delegate but all the individuals that have just signed a petition uh, we don't go to the lengths to advise them of the same information can we not ensure somehow that 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 happens i mean if you're signing a petition you're essentially coming as a delegate um, and supporting the people who spoke. So I think it's kind of, can, can we not have those names entered and even an email communication to all those people? Yeah, so, so through Mr. Chairman, so understanding the requests, staff can consider uh, other ways in which we can uh, inform the residents and really the, the broader public. Uh, but so as far as not necessarily putting out uh, formal communications by way of letters, but other means through websites, emails, we'll, we'll look at those items and follow up with, 
with uh, yourself and the other area councillors in particular. Okay. Um, I think. I think. So, sorry, we can't comment on on too much because this is only a public forum. So I will, I will leave it there. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can I move that the chair be heard? Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Uh, I was about to say through the chair, but. Uh, I guess the staff, so I've heard several times, and I know this is a, uh, 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 a process that sometimes residents don't understand. So I've had several people say that we allowed, or we uh, are allowing this. Can you explain our, our roles and responsibilities? And I know this is like uh, a planning one-on-one, uh, but can you talk about the independence of planning staff when reviewing an application, and what the role is, and just simply very quickly what the process is? Essentially, you know, just for full disclosure, uh, uh, you mentioned some of the uh, establishments uh, uh, in that clearance plaza. Probably no one uh, goes to that plaza more than myself as a frequent customer to a couple of those uh, businesses. So I'm, I'm fully aware of uh, uh, those establishments and uh, um, I travel along clearance probably on a daily basis. And, uh, um, but can you speak to about the roles and responsibilities and how this came to be and what we are talking about today. Yeah, so, sure, Mr. Chairman. So really, really planning in a nutshell as it relates to the development applications as they come in and how they're reviewed and processed and such. You know, staff are, are obligated to receive uh, every development application that a landowner would like to put through to us and pay the fee for and submit. So really staff doesn't have the ability to uh, not allow certain types of applications to come through, but we receive everything and have to review them all in the uh, uh, appropriate, consistent way as well. So uh, with every application that comes in, there's a, a range of uh, technical documents that come in as well in support of the application. Staff will be reviewing all of those technical documents with all of the various expertise that city staff have, with all the various divisions that are contained within the city with respect to engineering and urban design and so on and so forth. When it is that all of those technical reviews are completed, staff will be preparing then a recommendation or report through to committee and council for your consideration really with our recommendations as far as whether we believe that the application is considered to be appropriate planning or not. Uh, really the way in which staff uh, comes to determine whether uh, what our recommendations should be is to review the application really against uh, provincial legislation, uh, being the Provincial Places to Grow Act, the, the Planning Act, uh, various other legislation, legislative documents as well, as well as uh, the region's official plan, the city's official plan, to understand really how it, uh, it conforms in a general way and whether it might be appropriate plan or not. And so once the, once the assessment is completed with respect to those documents, all the technical studies will, as mentioned, be informing the area residents that have put through the communications through to us to advise on when the recommendation report is anticipated to go forward. The residents then would be able to uh, attend that meeting and if they would so choose, you know, could contact the clerk's office in advance of that meeting to ask to be, uh, to, or sorry, to provide a delegation through to committee if they wanted to speak to the matter after they've uh, reviewed the report, have understood the findings of staff and wanted to delegate to a committee, they, they could do that as well. Now, uh, at that point in time, it would be uh, really, uh, incumbent upon a committee and council to render a decision on the matter and thereafter the, the decision could be appealed if it was a refusal decision it could be appealed by the applicant if it was an approval decision it could be uh, appealed by uh, any of the area residents and such individuals that have commented on the application uh, i'd be glad to go into more detail if you like no, but, I, and, and i appreciate that and, and it's more so i understand uh, this is uh, there's complexity around this uh, but as councillor bowman stated tonight is not a night where we can provide our opinion uh, because then we prejudice the whole process. Um, what we have here is an application process under the Planning Act in which we're considering and all your comments are important to us. Uh, regarding the communication, um, I guess, I don't know if it's a motion that's required, but certainly understanding that we have our parameters in, ter in terms of communication, uh, but certainly I would uh, request that you work with Councillor Bowman and myself, ensuring that we get the communication out to all those who are on the, uh, I guess, the the petition and and further so um, that that we can do uh, but more so uh, um, I think then uh, just lastly my last question so we're going under uh, uh, a review of our official plan does that have any bearing or because the application 
came in before the final review, would that not have any impact? So through you, Mr. Chairman, the, the plan, planning application would be reviewed against the, the, all the current legislation and the current uh, official plan documentation that uh, here resides at the city as well. So staff always really have some consideration though to just uh, appropriate planning. And if it is that we're anticipating that there could be some changes to our official plan, you know, certain elements are taken into consideration in that respect. But in, in a very formal way, we have to have regard for the, for the current documents. Okay, great. Uh, Appreciate it. Are you back from the board, yes. Councilor Bowman? Okay, yeah. Councilor Bowman. Thank you through you, Mr. Chair. Just, just one last item. Um, in regards to the number of people that have signed the survey, um, or the uh, uh, petition, um, what we can do, I respect that it's a mail-out process and we do it to 200 meters. I'm sure that will get to a, a, a large number of you, but I think between Councilor Maderos and myself, we will ensure that anybody outside that 200 meter, we will hand deliver it ourselves if we have to, just so that everybody keeps informed. Yeah. Okay, so as I see, there's no further uh, questions or comments or just questions of clarification. I'd ask uh, someone to move receipt. Uh, I think uh, this would be more appropriate for Councillor Bowman to move receipt of the delegations on of the stock report. All in favor? Carried. So I will allow a couple minutes if everyone wants to uh, scoot back home and uh, please be careful driving. What's the lady's name to put the hat on? The one with the glasses? Hello. Oh, that's yeah. right. I gotta talk to her.
Sorry, my apologies. Uh, I'm looking at two different times here. Uh, so officially the time is 8.48, so we have two more minutes. But on, on another screen, it says 8.51. So, yeah, yeah. We'll just wait two more minutes. So our next item is uh, item it's delegations uh, regarding uh, her the Brampton minutes from the Brampton Heritage Board. Uh, so at this time, I'd like to invite Paul Vinder Gill. Okay, so if you just, uh, I will allow City Clerk, I'll look towards you for guidance. Is that okay that we allow the councillors to speak before the delegation? I think they want to give, provide some context. Through you, Mr. Chair, yes, if it's in regard to um, the Heritage Board recommendations. Yeah. Okay, so we will just, I'll hand it over to Councillor Woolens. Yeah, thank you, through the Chair and to the Clerk. Um, I'm assuming we'll be pulling, we'll be bringing uh, 8.1 forward. So because the delegation is referring to 8.1. So I'm wondering if we can deal with another item on 8.1 at the same time, because I know there are people here with respect to 8.1, and there's no point in dragging it on until we get to the report later on. Yeah, that's fair. We'll move up. Okay, thank, thank you. That's appropriate. Thank you. Uh, and I'll hand it over to you, Mr. Gill. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of council and staff, and the public. Tonight, I'm here to commend the initiation of uh, designation of 9393 McLaughlin Road North Heritage property. This is a very unique property. In whole Ontario, we have just 13 mud brick houses like this, and we are very lucky we have one in our city. So I really commend, you know, designation of this too and initiation as well, and I request council to allow appropriate use of this building so we can keep it for a longer time for the coming generations to know how these early settlers, you know, came here and settled and how they built these nice houses, you know. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much at this time. Uh, oh, I see Councilor Vicente, you'd like to ask a question in the Just delegation? Just a quick question. Yeah. Through you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Gill, for coming. Um, can you just explain to members of council here what your role is? Actually, I'm a member of Brampton Heritage Board as well since last three years. And uh, not just a member of Heritage Board, I restored one heritage house on Credit View Road. So I'm very passionate about these heritage 
houses, especially the farmhouses, because I was born and raised on a farmhouse too. So when I had very, very touching, you know, moments when I was restoring this house. One I met with somebody, she was about 90 years old and she came to that house. She was asking, what's happening to this house? I said, I'm gonna restore this as per the guidelines. She said, is it gonna stay here? I said, yes, it's gonna stay here. She said, I'm the great granddaughter of the first owner of this house. And when we were restoring this, every day, you know, parents will bring their kids to the house, tell them that what this building was and why we're gonna restore it. So this was kind of educational tour to the neighborhood. People used to take pictures of the house, you know, in front of the house. So my role is, you know, as a restoring person and a member of heritage board. So I really wanted to say something about this house as well. Thank you, Thank you, Chair. Just one final question. Are you here speaking on your own behalf or on behalf My of the My own Heritage behalf, board? not on the behalf of Brampton Heritage Board. Okay. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Vicente. I think uh, at this time it would be appropriate to um, bring report item 8.1. And I see uh, Councillor Willens is on the board. Councillor Willens. Yeah, speaking to... Uh, 8.1 in regards to 67 Main <coughs> Street South. Um, I just have a few, maybe staff can clarify a few things. Uh, it says on the bottom on, uh, I guess, one HBO 002-2020, item three, it says the opinion of Brampton Heritage Board that the Committee Adjustments Application A19-121 and B19-017 not be supported um, I'm just curious because um, on the staff report, and I believe the our heritage consultant were supportive of a were supportive of it as long as the criteria was met on the heritage impact assessment. Because um, I think it's out of the board's jurisdiction when it comes to severances that has to go back to the committee of adjustments anyway. So, can we get maybe a clarification on that? Why the board made this decision? Because in my opinion, it's. I sat on the Heritage Board, and I think it's out of the jurisdiction of the Heritage Board to make decisions that it should be at the Committee of Adjustments. I mean, the applicant still has to go through the proper procedures. He's still got to meet all the mitigation and everything else for surrounding, for surrounding neighborhoods as far as the tree protection and as far as the any heritage asset, as impact assessments. So I just want to, maybe if staff could clarify, I don't want to get in a lengthy discussion because it does still have to go back to the Committee of Adjustments anyway, but maybe if I know that there's some neighbors on, on in the area that are here, so I just want to make sure that we're clear that and protect uh, any, any decisions that council may make here. So through you, Mr. Chair, the Heritage Impact Assessment was brought forward to the Brampton Heritage Board to receive their opinion on that Heritage Impact Assessment. Uh, it's the same process as we usually go through for any other type of development application in terms of bringing it to the board. Um, this is a part four individually designated property at 67 Main Street South. Uh, and to the heritage staff did due diligence in terms of benchmarking to determine that the way that other municipalities had dealt with similar situations was to bring a heritage impact assessment to their municipal advisory committee for their uh, consideration. And so this is what heritage staff did in this instance as well. And it provides the board the opportunity to uh, see the recommendations of the heritage consultant and heritage staff regarding an application that has to go through a parallel process with committee of adjustment but it provides basically a roadmap for should that development app, should that committee of adjustment application be approved, these are the recommendations that the heritage consultant and heritage staff have laid out. So thank you for that. So the heritage board would review the heritage impact assessment, not the severance. Through you, Mr. Chair, that is correct. Okay, just to be clear on that. Okay, uh, I see that Councillor Vicente is on the board, so I'll let him speak. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Vicente. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, too, um, was uh, at, the, at this meeting, and uh, I think that the, um, the conversation around the table uh, missed that the opportunity that was presented by the staff report to ensure that when the proposal comes forward and the site plan, et cetera, um, that uh, there is a measure of um, control with respect to um, what the outcome of that uh, site plan and 
what the owner uh, ends up building there. Uh, particularly, I think one concern that I think spoke loudly to me was uh, concerns around the protection of the natural heritage, which are the tree system around that property. And uh, I think that um, staff's report uh, spoke to the uh, applicant ensuring that protections are in place during the build if it happens. And um, I think that um, supporting that staff report will be important at this stage. We don't know what the outcome may be of the uh, Committee of Adjustment, but um, I think that what staff have recommended and asked for us to provide and to ensure happens going forward is important for this committee to support. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So at this time, um, was, I think you would like to propose an amendment to that? Okay, Councillor Vicente. <laughs> so um, what we are therefore uh, attempting to do, Mr. Chair, and perhaps the clerk can provide guidance, we are looking to approve um, the report by staff on the 67 Main Street South Ward 3 Heritage Impact Assessment, which was item 8.1 of the um, agenda that evening at the Heritage Board. So through you, Mr. Chair, um, the Heritage Board uh, recommendation, which is HB002-2020, is on the screen, as contained in the minutes item 8.1 on tonight's agenda. It had three parts. The first is just receiving delegations that were uh, received at that meeting. The second is receiving the staff report that was referenced. And the third is an opinion statement by the Brampton Heritage Board in regard to the applications. So I gather what Councillor Vasante is introducing is striking out part three, as shown on the screen, and replacing it um, with, and you'll see in red here, these are the staff recommendations that were contained in the original report. Um, recommendation number one has already been addressed about receiving the report. So recommendations two and three here would be substituted in for three in the previous committee recommendation. I think that's the intent. And by doing that, the staff recommendations presented at the January 21st Brampton Heritage Board uh, would be um, brought forward and presented from this committee to council on the 26th of February. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. And you know, with all due respect to the recommendation of the Heritage Board, of course. Uh, if I might, committees will, if you wish to hear delegations, more than happy uh, to come forward and, and delegate. Uh, do I need a motion to move? Sure. I'll move. Okay, I'll move by Councillor Vicente. All in favor? Carried. So if you can just come forward and state your name for public record, please. Thank you for agreeing to listen. Uh, my name is Alan McClelland. I live at 66 Elizabeth Street South. It is uh, an adjacent property beside the laneway uh, that uh, is in question. Uh, just for clarification, the, the Heritage Board um, received a report from the city planner. Uh, we delegated at that meeting and pointed out that it was incomplete, inaccurate, and there was a lot of information not shared with the Heritage Board. The Heritage Board discussed the issues. Um, to quote some of them, it was just a bad idea and why not stop it right here? So that's, that's what happened at the meeting. And I'm not sure if there's other uh, members of the Heritage Board here, but <clears throat> you've got a, a volunteer uh, Board, uh, committee of citizens that spent at least an hour, hour and a half on this, and the um, recording secretary, for lack of a better term, assisted with with phrasing this uh, motion that was adopted. But the the concerns of the committee 
was that the, the uh, staff report was not accurate. There was um, an arborist report not shared with the um, Heritage Board members. And uh, as far as the heritage uh, value of this asset, it was, it was discussed over an hour and a half, and only one person dissented in, in supporting this motion. So perhaps the, the committee might have been misguided as to what they're allowed to vote on, but they definitely did not support the recommendation of staff. So you're saying that you're, you're opening the door for the planning committee to say, um, we would support it. And I, and I wonder whether the planning committee has all the information. Because there are independent reports that were inaccurate, incomplete. There's a number of submissions filed with the city that were never shared uh, with the Heritage Board, so I wonder if they're shared with you folks. And uh, I think, for lack of a better term, this is a bit of a sham, considering uh, reversing what a volunteer committee has already uh, um, adopted. We thought this would be, you know, is, is the motion accurate or not? Are you adopting the minutes or not? That's what happened at the meeting. And this is just receiving and recognizing that, that that's accurate from, from my understanding. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, does staff want to comment? Oh, okay. Uh, staff maybe can comment on in terms of do we have all the information and some reports which were omitted. So I would ask <clears throat> staff to comment, please. Certainly. From, uh, from our perspective, uh, Mr. The, the report was complete. It was accurate. Um, had all the uh, details that were necessary to, uh, within scope for what the Heritage Committee was looking at. The Arbus report was separate from what the, was directly under consideration. But all the, the relevant pieces were there and were uh, comfortable with the degree and accuracy of the material that was in the report. Okay. Thank you. Uh, please come forward. State your name for public record. Mark Emery Weston Consulting here on behalf of the applicant for this Committee of Adjustment application. So this is a bit unusual. Uh, however, I, I have to say I was at the committee meeting and uh, um, it, it seemed to me that, um, that, you know, they were asking questions about arborist information, etc., which was not before them because it's a heritage board. And uh, I also want to point out that the heritage board is advisory to committee and council. So they've given their opinion to not support a severance. Um, the merits, I, I felt uh, the heritage impact assessment prepared by the heritage consultant was very well done. There was a very thorough report prepared by city staff, um, which uh, analyzed and addressed that report and put forward some very stringent recommendations, including requirement for a detailed site plan, requirement for a heritage permit, um, uh, requirement for mitigation measures for the trees, etc. So there were a number of recommendations which were adequately addressed in that report and I don't think were fully considered at the Heritage Board. Um, so the, I think the last, deleting the last part of that motion and replacing it with a staff recommendation is entirely appropriate and we're in support of that. Okay, thank you very much. Paul Willoughby. I'm here tonight as a 16-year member of the Brampton Heritage Board. I'm the longest serving member at present on the board, and I'd like to do a bit of clarification. The Ontario Heritage Act now allows us to designate other than buildings. We are now able to do bridges, landscapes, and everything. So I feel the trees on that property and in the neighboring property which are going to be greatly affected. I am a horticulturalist with over 40 years of training. I worked in forestry for many years in the city of Etobicoke. The, and I explained to people there that, okay, your tree's here, but your root system's way out there. So these neighbors, their root system is where this house is going to be built. Okay, they're going to dig a basement. They got a 17 and a half driveway coming in off of Wellington Street. 
how are they going to, uh, off of Wellington, or off, yeah, no, off of um, Mill, or Elizabeth. How are they going to get equipment in? But that's beside the point. Our motion was to advise the, not to advise you or council that we were, we advised the people of committee of adjustment that we were not in favor of this severance. We did not direct our motion. I made the motion. We did not make the motion that night that it would go, that we were just advising the committee of adjustment that we were not in favor of the, of the, of the severance. We were, not, we were not directing it to you because we figured it still had to go through severance, so that's where our motion went. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I have no further delegations. I have two members of committee on the board. Councillor Singh. Yeah, um, I'm looking at uh, number three, and we're looking at striking this out. Is that what, we're, what I'm understanding? Yeah. Through you, through you, Mr. Chair, I believe that's Councillor Vasante's proposal in his motion. Okay. And is this out of... I, for lack of better word, out of the jurisdiction, the, the I think it's just an opinion statement. I'm, I'm, I don't know why. I mean, they can have an opinion, and I'm really confused why. Why? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes, Councillor Vicente. I'm going to go Councillor Willens wants to go first. Okay, Councillor Willens. Just quickly, um, reading through the minutes from the Heritage Board. Um, the heritage consultants were in attendance that night, correct? But yet there was no questions put forward from the board to them. Apparently, I, now I could be wrong. I'm just reading what was in the minutes. I'm just curious. That's all. Yeah. Okay. All right. They, they were asked if they wanted to say anything. Okay. 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 All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Back to Councillor Singh. I, I think Councillor Vicente was saying you want to add clarification, but okay. I'll continue after him. Uh, okay, Councillor Vicente. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, as I mentioned to the clerk before, I, I think we still need to respect the opinion of the Heritage Board. And so perhaps it, what is not needed is a striking of number three, but this committee's endorsement of the staff report as it was written. Would that be correct? If correct, judging on what Paul said. Judging what Okay, is that satisfactory, Councillor Singh? Any? F okay, do you like any further questions or no? Are you, yeah. Are you done? Yeah. Are, no? are we able to uh, to the clerk uh, make recommendations to the committee of adjustment? Yeah. So. so through you, Mr. Chair, the committee of adjustment is a quasi-independent um, decision-making body uh, for minor variances and consents and. Uh, uh, by that very nature, council and committee shouldn't be directing that. Yeah. Um, however, that's why in, in the minutes and in item three here, we have prefaced the Heritage Board's opinion. It, it is the opinion of. Yeah. That in no way um, dictates what the Committee of Adjustment shall do. Okay. It will still look at these applications independently based on its own merits. Yeah. So we're not striking out three, just to be clear. Okay. Okay. So through you, Mr. Chair, then if Councillor Vasante's motion is is really then to keep HB002 as is and add to it clauses two and three from uh, which are on the screen right now, which come directly from the staff report that was considered at the Heritage Board on January 21st. Okay, Councillor Singh, you have the floor. Okay. Okay, members of committee, we have a motion on the floor. Moved by Council Vicente. All in favor? Hands up. Carried. Okay, thank you. Okay, and uh, the minutes as amended. Moved by Councilor. Do you have another? Council Vicente, you'd like to be on the board? Yes. Thank you. Uh, with respect to the Brampton Heritage Board's minutes, um, I would like to request a deferral of, uh, referral. Referral of item 10.1 on uh, those minutes.
with respect to 9393 McLaughlin Road. My reasons for doing this, and it's wonderful to see um, members of the community delegating to these various issues and presenting all the different sides. We had a delegate speaking in favor of the designation of 9393 McLaughlin Road, but what is, I think, glaringly absent here today are the owners of 9393 McLaughlin Road. Um, if we uh, approve uh, this recommendation, uh, this motion today, um, we are essentially putting them into a process that is, uh, is not necessarily um, transparent to them. They may not understand the process fully. I'd like to give them an opportunity and if staff could engage with them to ensure that for the next planning meeting, they have the opportunity to delegate to this committee before we make this final decision. Okay. Yes, please. Through you, Mr. Chair, I have been in constant communication, not necessarily on a monthly basis, but since 2017, I have been corresponding with the owners of this property. Uh, when we found out that it was a mud brick house, they were very aware of this. Uh, they were aware that the property was listed, and I had a meeting with them in early 2018 because I wanted to sit down with them and discuss designation and moving forward with designation because this property was so significant and so rare in Ontario being one of only 13 houses that we know of uh, that is of earth and architecture construction. Um, and the numbers are based on a report that was done by a woman named Lauren Drowns who's an earth and architecture specialist who specifically wrote a report about Ontario architecture, earth and architecture. Um, so I had numerous conversations with the owners about moving forward designation of this property. In 2017, we agreed at that time that we would put this to the side so that they could try to sell the property. It's been two years, and we want to make sure that any people who come forward with interest in this property understand that it has significance, and it's not, as, as many people often say, just listed. This is a very significant property in Ontario. And for heritage staff, this is, this is a very important designation that we want to move forward with. Uh, we understand it's council's final decision. Uh, I was in correspondence with the property owners last week. Uh, I sent them an email informing them of this meeting and the council meeting coming up, so they were aware of those. And one of the things that I've pointed out to them is that designation applies to real property, but we can work with them on a survey to identify the exact portion of that property which should be designated so that it doesn't apply to the whole property. It would just apply necessarily to the house, the environ around the house, and to some of the conservation area in the back, which can't be developed anyways. Fletcher's Creek, which runs through the back of the property, is named after the family that built that house. And so from a heritage perspective in terms of the Ontario Heritage Act, the provincial policy statement, this is a very important a uh, cultural heritage resource for Brampton. Um, and we understand that we want to work, for, work, work with the owners, whoever may buy it in the future, to find its adaptive reuse. Uh, and we think that this can be better, better done with designation, because that way, going forward, the intention to conserve this property is clear. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, both Councillor Santos and I, who represent the area, respect all the work that staff have done and we do not disagree uh, with their call to have this uh, property designated. And actually, before this evening, we were going to support it as it is. Uh, but seeing that uh, we had a delegate in favor, but I do not, I'm not confident that the owners knew that this meeting was happening tonight. I think they would have been here had they known. They would have been here even if not, nothing more than to listen. And so um, I would, like to offer them that opportunity um, and we may find that um, I'm not certain of that counselor um, so I'd like to offer them the opportunity to speak to this at by the next planning meeting okay uh, so through you mr. chair um, Councillor Vasante are you moving deferral instead of referral deferral is postponing this recommendation until to allow the property owners to be invited to the next planning committee meeting, which is scheduled for March 9th, I believe. I can. What? <laughs> okay. So is that what you plan on tending to do, Councilor Vicente? 
it's to clarification. it is to postpone the decision on this one item to the next planning meeting where we will make the decision but have giving the owners full opportunity to delegate at that meeting if they so choose okay so it's a deferral moved by Councillor okay Councillor Singh you're on the board yeah, I was just wondering if it's more appropriate to send it to planning and they can delegate there. Or is there delegation planning. at that point? Planning. Sorry, uh, I meant heritage. No, no. Planning. Do you want to have Heritage has already dealt with. Oh. Okay, thank you. So now we have a motion moved by Councillor Vicente. Through you, Mr. Chair. A deferral motion is not debatable. Yeah. Okay. okay. So the motion is to defer HB 004 2020 to the March 9th Planning and Development Committee meeting and to, and to request that staff notify the property owners should they wish to come to delegate at that meeting on this recommendation. As uh, stated by the clerk, all in favor? Carried, thank you. Uh, our next item is staff presentation uh, by Manager of Bourbon Design, uh, Yvonne Jung. I would invite you to come forward. Welcome, Yvonne. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of Planning and Development Services Committee, members of public. My name is Yvonne Young. I'm the manager of Urban Design for the Planning and Development Services Commission. I'm before you today to introduce the Urban Design Review Panel to explain how the panel can be used to elevate design excellence of our urban communities for our future citizens, businesses, and development partners. To explain how the Urban Design Review Panel fits within the development assessment process. And lastly, to seek endorsement of the successful results of the Urban Design Review Panel pilot project and to obtain authorization to continue with the review panel on a permanent basis for the City of Brampton. The details are outlined in the companion report, which is the next item on the agenda. Our chair of the Design Review Panel, Eric Turcott, is also in attendance tonight. Welcome. The Council endorsed Brampton 2040 vision and envisioned the City of Brampton being a city by design, where design excellence uphold public interest in approval and other decisions for change. It shapes private developments and public projects through the lens of design and peer review. It elevates technical standards for sustainability, accessibility, crime prevention, and health enhancement, and the intention to draw wealth, talent, and dedication to give Brampton a competitive edge. In 2017, City Council endorsed the Urban Design Review Panel as a two-year pilot project to meet the demand of rapid growth and increased complexity of developments in our urban areas. It also to ensure intensification and infield developments are achieved with high quality urban design and to bring in added value and professional expertise while complementing the city design review process. The Urban Design Review Panel focuses on shaping design priority areas, which include the urban growth centers and centers such as downtown, uptown, and Bramley, the mobility hubs and major station areas, including Brampton Go, Bramley Go, and the Mount Pleasant Go, and the designated intensification corridors, including Queen Street, Hero Ontario Street, and Steels Avenue. The multidisciplinary composition of the panel serves as an independent advisory body to advocate high quality design, creativity, and innovation in our built environments. The combined perspective of the panel provides a well-rounded design assessment of development and public projects. It also broadens industry awareness of the importance of high quality design and it develops effective and collaborative working relationship with the development industry. The current panel members consist of eight experienced design professionals, including three architects, 
three landscape architects, and two urban designers. Panel members <coughs> are required to have a minimum 10 years of full membership in their respective professional <coughs> bodies and fair knowledge of the composition and character of Brampton, as well as the rest of the Greater Toronto Area. <coughs> or moving forward, staff recommend expanding the panel membership to include a transportation engineer, a member from the Peel Public Health Office, and also a professionally recognized heritage conservation specialist. One of the most value add the Urban Design Review Panel has brought to the city building process is a holistic review of the relationship between individual projects and also the broader city building mission. In addition to development application, significant city-led studies, plans, guidelines, capital building and infrastructure projects have been brought forward to the panel to obtain design inputs and to discuss strategies to effectively translate the work into well-designed built environments. As part of the design review process, proposals are presented in relation to the surrounding public and private development, streetscape, public realm, parks and open space, natural features and trail networks, and key destinations and place-making opportunities within a hundred walking distance. The below examples is a project that abuts a valley system and a railway corridor. In addition to highlighting design opportunities that improve the quality of the new addition to the neighborhood, the panel also highlight opportunities to improve the surrounding character through this new proposal. This include creating a central outdoor amenity space as the focal point of the community, arranging buildings so that main entrances are fronting onto the streets, adding a variety of housing types and age-friendly features to make healthy living, intergenerational living, and independent living possible for youth, families, and seniors. And lastly, redistributing the built for massing to create a new gateway to the neighborhood and to improve the interface with the surrounding valley system and rail corridor. The panel review is also integrated with the development assessment process. The goal is to start the process early in order to provide flexibility for incorporating strategies that can review untapped opportunities and also to improve the overall performance of the project. As early as the time of pre-application, prior to formal pre-consultation. City staff liaison with development partners to prepare materials for the panel review. Development partners have the opportunity to present their proposal, followed by a conversation with the panel. The goals are to provide a greater level of clarity of the project and to receive advice and design recommendation that serve to improve the overall performance of the project. City staff will further provide meeting minutes that summarize the design advice as well as the panel recommendation for further review if needed. Staff have also conduct, conducted a survey to obtain feedback from the Urban Design Review panel participants. The results of the consultation are largely positive. This gives staff the confidence to recommend the Urban Design Review panel becoming a permanent program for the City of Brampton. Currently, the panel design reviews are largely guided by the Brampton 2040 vision, the council approved policy and guidelines, city staff site specific insights and interpretation of city policies, and also professional design analysis of the strengths and opportunities of a project with a goal to achieve better contextual response, good fit, and transition. On moving forward, the panel has the opportunity to use the many made in Brampton tools to provide well-rounded design assessment. This include physical and digital models to provide a context of the future urban community, the use of precinct plans to evaluate the opportunity to achieve a high quality design in both development and public projects, and the use of GIS and 3D visualization tools to evaluate the design success of meeting a number of terms of council party, including streets for people, healthy citizens, support community hub concept, create and create complete communities. Thank you for your attention. We look forward to continue with this great, great program to move Bremen towards becoming a city by design. Thank you very much. I see Councillor Santos on the board. Thank you, um, through you, Chair. Just a quick question. Sometimes when um, these panels are formed, um, a lot of the work and the reviews happen in the walls of the planning department or like inside this building or on um, 
the computers, for example. How often would the review panel go out there to actually be on the ground, talk to the community, look at the actual area that's being designed? Well, is, is, like, is that typical? Will they, will they be out there just to, because some, it, things are different when you actually are in the setting that you're designing, right? Well, through the chair, that's a fantastic observation. I think that's one of the things that as uh, uh, professionals working in a design field, it, it's, it's helpful <laughs> to see what's actually on the ground. The panel members themselves will often go to the sites or uh, look and get a better idea of the context. It's not something that the panel does as a, as a whole. Uh, many of them, though, also have other working projects within Brampton or within the, uh, the broader area. So generally, I think they, they would make sure that they, they're familiar with the context that they're working in. But it's not something we do as a group with the panel or that we, we do. One of the other things, though, is we do do tours. So okay. not around specific applications, but as far as that general context, they, there are opportunities to go and introduce them to the things that uh, make Brampton unique. Okay, great, thanks. I just wanted to ask because sometimes when you're looking at something on a computer screen, it looks very different. It feels very different when it's actually put into the ground. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. As I see, there's no further questions or comments. Thank you again to staff for the presentation. Can I get someone to uh, uh, move receipt? Uh, moved by Councillor Willens. All in favor? Thank you very much. Next item. Oh, my apologies. We have the accompanying staff report. Are there any questions? Councillor Bowman. Thank you very much through you, Mr. Chair. Um, Yvonne, oh, she's gone. Just wondering, is, what is the cost yes. that, that we're asking for to carry this on permanently now? For you, Mr. Chair, um, in the staff report, it outlined the administration budget for this panel is... Um, so, through the chair, very quickly, the, um, the actual budget, so all of the panel members uh, agree to volunteer their time to the panel, so there, there isn't, uh, there isn't a, a direct cost there. We do feed them lunch. Um, <laughs> I think it's important. Uh, so we've got a budget of about uh, $10,000 for the year to, for, for that. And as well, there is some staff time devoted to it, and that's, that's uh, been one position that we've had on a contract basis. Through the review of the department and the operational needs, we'll determine what that will need to be going forward to continue to support the, uh, the program. But I'd say, uh, you know, for the, uh, the benefit that we receive, it's a pretty modest uh, contribution. Okay, so this, would, this is a budget line action. Is that correct? So it's uh, included in the, uh, not this year's budget, but next year's budget. So for the remainder of this year, we, we have the funds to, to fund the, the contract position that we had had. And then what we'd be doing is looking at that for a position for next year uh, to continue the, the program. As I said, looking at whether it's a full-time position that's required or a part-time uh, mixed in with some other duties is part of the departmental review, the renewal program that we're looking at right now. So that's, that's one of the reasons why in terms of uh, holding off on action, actioning a particular position for this, uh, that'll be incorporated in that review process. Okay, so we've, we've not moved anybody into any position that's for this, have we? So we have hired someone. Uh, so we had a contract position when we initially started. So we oh. have an urban design coordinator who was hired specifically to support this. So that person has actually moved into another permanent position. Um, but we have also uh, provided other ways of supporting the, the committee as it goes forward. So we've, we've, we've been able to provide for that support uh, through the duration of the pilot and then for the remainder of this year. Okay, I just want to be sure that we're not moving money around from budget to budgets before we actually do our budget consultations, which, which begin next week. Yep. So. If there's no impact on this budget um, in terms of personnel moving, uh, salary being reallocated, uh, time being reallocated from another project or position, um, I'm okay with that. But if there's any of that, then I would prefer to fully move this into our budget and look at it at, at the budget time, which is in two weeks. So at, at this point, there is no impact to the budget. The the supports are there. We're, we would continue to operate as we have, so we wouldn't be looking for additional resources in this budget. Okay, and uh, all the all the experts that are willing to give their time for the next. Uh, they are, and as well, we've had some conversations with the the additional three uh, that have been identified to to round out the complement. Okay, and just just a question. 
no offense meant to anybody, but um, never started off with. Sorry, <laughs> no offense meant to anybody, but how many of them are from Brampton? You know, I can't think off the top of my head who's who's where. So I didn't look at anybody's home address. Um, I know you know they come from throughout the G GTA uh, and even further afield. Um, turn around, do you know Avon? So, why don't you use Eric? Uh, I'm uh, Eric Kirkcott. I'm the <laughs> chair of the design review panel. So the composition of the members of the, um, uh, of the panels are from across the GTA. We have some uh, person from the Niagara region. We have uh, uh, who is actually with the city of, uh, of, I believe, the city of Niagara Falls. Uh, I am a private practitioner with Urban Strategies in Toronto. I'm a partner there. We have a partner from... Uh, DTAH is also located in, in Toronto. We have uh, a member from Mississauga, uh, Jason, and a few of the members from uh, other private sector from all within the region. Most of these, um, so like as it was mentioned, we dedicate our time because we love uh, we love the city. We've done work around either around Brampton, around the region, or across Canada, or some of us across the world as well. So. Part of this is bringing an expertise from, and our experience from, uh, from all over the world. Okay. Well, if, if possible, I'd like to see somebody added to the panel who's local and, and, and has a vested interest here in the city. So just my opinion. It's, it's totally up to you guys what you, what you do from there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Bowman. And, and actually, actually, Mr. Turcotte, if you can come, uh, uh, mea culpa, because I was asked before... Uh, we opened up to committee to introduce uh, you um, as the chair of the Branton Urban Design Review Panel uh, and allow you to uh, maybe make uh, some few remarks. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, member of committees. Yeah, it's really a delight to be here today. I'm, um, I'm uh, like I was mentioned, the chair of the Design Review Panel. I'm a partner at Urban Strategies. I'm an architect, a planner and a, uh, and a uh, urban designer. Um, as mentioned, you said our objective with the design, uh, design review panel is to elevate the discourse of design, looking at growth, but also making sure that as projects come forward, they are uh, of extremely high quality. We look at projects that are public, that are private. Uh, we're look, looking at public realm, at parks, at buildings, at all the various element that makes up our city. So that's something that we're quite uh, passionate about. And we, um, and, and we think that the, we, f we believe that as the panels are, as, as a whole is made up of urban designer, planner, there will be the addition of an engineer's uh, heritage, uh, that this group brings a varied expertise from across Canada, across the, across the region, and can help to elevate the design promote, as uh, was mentioned in some, um, some earlier presentation, looks at how the project fits, how it contributes, how it can be adjusted, perfected. Uh, and often is simply by having that discussion with the, uh, with the developer, with um, uh, the proponent. That's something that, so it's involved a great, a great dialogue. It's a conversation uh, that we want to see and continue to, uh, to do. We think that um, I would like to add that these conversation and opinion, and you could see the statistic are very constructive. Frankly, I found that the this is a pro, uh, the panel that works very well. That is actually is very respect uh, respected. That is also is a very professional. It's a discord that doesn't focus on the details, but on the big picture, making sure it fits, making sure it's the materiality, that the landscape approach, that the built form, the massing, all look at it holistically, uh, based on some of the document that you've been approving. So so. Vision 2040, your official plan, your zoning, and then, but these documents in itself are not enough for uh, to guarantee good design excellence. That discussion with the uh, with the developers, with the city, is actually something that we think elevates the discourse uh, at a civic level. So, again, I think that I also would like to um, to commend city staff for all their great work that has actually been dedicated during this pilot project uh, period. Uh, it's actually, as I said, we are dedicating our time because we're passionate, so we actually, we're free, um, except for the sandwich that uh, are being offered and the coffee. Uh, and um, uh, the city has been fantastic, a great support, and uh, I think that this is, um, I, I also believe that 
the panel should be, uh, as it is in many cities across the, across the country, uh, made permanent here, because I think it is contributing to elevating uh, the design excellence in Brampton. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so can I get someone to move uh, receipt of the delegation and also uh, move uh, staff report 7.1? Uh, Councilor Vicente, all in favor? Carried, thank you. Um, our next item, 7.2. Oh, 7.2 is in consent, right? Uh, 7.3, that was pulled? Yes. Councilor Palushi. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I've spoke to uh, staff and, and now uh, most recently the, uh, the consultant on the file. Um, and I, I think uh, Councillor Willens and I would like to uh, first say to members, like this is, a, this is an extremely important, important area of Brampton where um, there's a lot of access, a lot of uh, uh, good transit. And we feel that there uh, is supporting this. And although I do support a medical um, building uh, particularly in this area, but for redevelopment of this area, there's huge potential for higher employment opportunities. Um, so that being said, I'd like to uh, maybe, uh, I would like to refer this back to staff and request that uh, maybe the consultant uh, reach out to the area councillors um, with staff uh, so we can sit down and, and have a discussion on, uh, on kind of the future of this area, not only this area, but the potential for uh, uh, for this building um, exceeding what uh, um, what we truly desire uh, for this area. So I've asked for a referral, Mr. Chair. Okay, members of the committee, you have a referral moved by Councillor Palachi. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. There was also an amendment that um, staff was requesting and Peter was gonna put it up on the screen. Uh, and it's just that no further uh, notice of the public be required for the attached zoning bylaw amendment pursuant to section 13.7 of the Planning Act. Um, and that's also included in the referral to be discussed when it comes back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Let's have a good discussion. No okay. Uh, so, do we need to move that again, Senator Clerk? Okay. So, we have someone on the board, Councillor Singh. Yeah, I was looking at uh, this uh, report. As well. How long have the application been uh, on file? How long have they been waiting? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry, I don't have the exact timeline uh, with me at this moment in time. It, I would perhaps guess at this point in time it's, it would be approximately a year. Uh, what I could offer though further to that is that uh, there, there has been some policy issues that uh, staff has been really, uh, navigating as it relates to the, the progress on this file. And so recently we have been able to work out a, an appropriate solution to be able to navigate the, the policy matters a little bit better. Uh, given that uh, this report and recommendation of uh, support for it really is uh, mirrored in some way with uh, with another policy report uh, as it relates to application, sorry, uh, report here 7.2. So the, the two reports combined have allowed us to pr be able to proceed and support the application, but there it took, uh, there was some time that was needed in order to be able to, to prepare, prepare an arrangement to that effect, but um, long, long story short, per perhaps a, a year or so through you, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Singh. So we have a, a motion moved by Councillor Palushi, a referral moved by Councillor Palushi. All in favor? Carried, thank you. Uh, next item. That's a consent. Sorry. For referred matters list. Do any members have questions regarding the referred matters list? Sorry, 7.5? Ah, it was pulled. It was pulled. Yes. Councillor Santos. Thank you, through you, Chair. Happy to see this report come forward. Just a couple of questions uh, on 7.5-3. Um, 
it says uh, the purpose of this report is to provide a status update on the comprehensive uh, zoning bylaw review and to propose moving forward with an amendment to the city's parking standards to address the following. I'm wondering, because uh, I didn't notice it here, anything, are we going to be looking at provisions for EV charging stations in parking spots as well as car share? We've spoken about it a bit in various planning meetings. I just want to make sure that it's also included in this. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, to Councillor Santos, yes, we will be looking at that, but we thought that that would be dealt with through the overall comprehensive zoning bylaw. What okay. we're proposing as part of this report is moving forward with some key parking amendments that we've heard from the development industry and some also previous council decisions with uh, direction with respect to parking. So we definitely will be looking at that as part of the comprehensive, but not moving forward with it Great. at this exact time. Okay, thank you. And then my final thing is about communication to the developers, because this is good news for them, especially those who are interested in developing near transit hubs or in urban centers. How will this be sent over to the developers? Or communicated, um, sorry. Through you, um, Mr. Chairman, through Councillor Santos, um, I get at the beginning of the comprehensive zoning bylaw, review we have been um, gathering a contact list and uh, definitely did notify everyone that was on that contact list with respect to this report that is on planning committee today and did receive some feedback Great. that the developer uh, industry was happy with this and timing the question is always how fast can it <laughs> come back um, I'm not sure in terms of other uh, yeah. communication strategies um, perhaps we can think about that and sure. I just I just want to flag it because it is good news for for them I'm sure um, so that's it thank you okay great so would you like to move it yeah. move. oh my apologies Councillor Singh yeah I, I sorry she's all the way I, I didn't hear the first question it was about the EV chargers okay my my question is regarding um, so the first day of council that we started we had a delegation from Kevin Montgomery about uh, parking permits. And so this whole strategy was supposed to encompass that because we took it off the referred matters list because we were having this uh, comprehensive strategy. So are we s still looking at parking permits or, or otherwise we need to bring, that's not fair to the delegation then because we removed it off no. the list. So uh, through, through the chair to the councilor, this is um, if you, the, let me back up. The two unit um, parking report, the, the second unit that we, we dealt with, one of those recommendations that we're actually moving forward with is to do a comprehensive municipal parking strategy. So that that will look at what these do not look at because these are zoning based is they are the, the on private property. Uh, so what we are going to be looking at and we have that as, as part of our work plan coming uh, later this year is to look comprehensively uh, with Public Works at the on-street parking, which will look at parking permits and all those other sorts of opportunities. So it, there, uh, there is a study that will address okay, that, and it's, uh, it's queued up. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So uh, uh, move receipt of the report, moved by Councillor Santos. All in favor? Carry, <coughs> thank you very much. Approval of the report, my apologies. Uh, move approval by Councillor Santos. All in favor, carried again. Uh, now we go on to the referred matters list. Do any members have any questions regarding the referred matters list? Councillor Singh. Oh, uh, no. Uh, oh, no. Nope. Okay. So there's no questions. Um, uh, I believe 10.1 is moved to consent. Referred matter, correspondence. Uh, we've moved to correspondence already. Uh, Councillor, question period. No, public question period. Anyone? In? No? Okay, yes, please come forward. It's okay. Take your time. Just uh, watch your step. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm actually here regarding um, your agenda item 7.4, uh, which I think um, was not brought up. So I was just wondering if um, we went to 7.5, but not 7.4. And the reason why I'm interested is because I'm directly adjacent to this property. And the last time I was here, April 9th in 2018, for um, a meeting of this sort, and we presented our concerns, but 
as of January 30th, 30th, this is the first time we've heard of the recommendation report being brought forward. So I'm interested to know more, um, and um, as well as what's what's being presented. Well, um, at this time, I think we can <coughs> consider, as this was in consent, and someone would like to delegate, I'd leave it up to Area Councillor, Councillor uh, Singh, if you'd like to reopen. Uh, I believe we need two-thirds to be able to... So would you like to, yep, so you'd like to move reopening? 7.4, you'd like to delegate on the matter, is that correct? Ah, uh, yes. Okay, so we'll have to reopen it. I need two thirds vote, all in favor, open, okay. And we will now open uh, item 7.4 and uh, please, uh, we'll, uh, you have five minutes and you've stated your name and go ahead. Not to worry, I won't take the full five minutes. Um, ideally here, I was just, I've asked for a copy of the recommendation report. As I said, July, January 30th was the first that we heard that the report was being presented forward or finalized. And I just wanted to reaffirm some of our concerns from the property. Uh, the original, uh, original uh, concepts presented failed to really present the residential properties along the west side of Clarkway. Um, some of the matters also, the drawings that were originally sent out demonstrate that old Clarkway merges with new Clarkway, and it does not. It actually ends in a, a little bit of a, a boulevard or crescent, if you want to call it. Um, so some of our concerns presented back then were security. Um, there is the concern about a second entrance onto the old Clarkway area. Um, uh, we were also concerned about the fact of a, of a drive through restaurant, um, noise, um, as well as, um, I would say, smells. Um, I have two children, and um, as well as, um, also I've enjoyed the agri agricultural area around us. Um, you know, although I don't like the skunks that much, um, there are some, some habitats currently in existence in the agri agriculture that do frequent our properties, and so I would have concerns about whether that assessment has been made as well. Um, lighting recently has been installed, which is, which is grateful, but the other thing also is about the maintenance of Old Clark Wayne. It has been an ongoing issue that we've continued to report on 411, regarding the, the actual uh, wood cut, sorry, grass cutting um, and whatnot. So um, if this were to move forward, how is that um, also going to be considered as part of the overall plan? Because I understand pedestrian access, pedestrian access from Versailles would probably be one of the benefits being presented. And so if you move from Versailles to Old Clarkway, it currently is just rubble. And so myself and my children kind of, we kind of, they enjoy the mud but I assume that really is not going to add the added value to the properties being discussed as to the daycare and, and whatnot. And I mean, not to say it's not to happen, but with all the frequent considerations of, you know, shootings and parking lots and things like that, my living room is pretty much um, across the street from wherever the proposed parking area would be, and I'd hate to become a statistic, at least one of my members of my family too. Um, so also about how is that barrier also going to be protected and whatnot. And, uh, and that's really it. I just wanted to reaffirm some of my, our original um, comments that we brought back forward. Um, so that was the reason for me attending tonight. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so at this time, I do not see any questions or comments to the delegation. And I believe, uh, Clerk, just for um, procedurally, would we have to move the report again? Yes. Okay. So um, <coughs> at this time, uh, would anyone like to move the report? Um, okay, can I get someone to move the report? So moved by Councillor Willens. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Thank I you appreciate very much. your time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so public question periods on any member, further members? No? So we have no closed session today and Last item of business is adjournment. Our next meeting is Monday, March 9th at 7 p.m. I thank you uh, for everyone's uh, attention and attendance tonight. Uh, moved by Councillor Fortini. All in favor? Carried. Thank you very much. March 9th.